Hello and welcome to exciting tutorial on Linux. In this video, we are going to explore what Linux is and why it is so awesome. At its most basic level, Linux is an operating system. It's the software that runs on your computer and allows you to interact with it. It is free and open source operating system that allows you to do all sorts of amazing things with your computer. Linux was created back in the early 1990s by a Finnish programmer named Linus Torvalds who wanted to make an operating system that was accessible to everyone without any restrictive licensing or fees. Today, Linux is used by millions of people around the world from hobbyists and students to scientists and developers. One of the biggest benefits of Linux is its openness. Because it's open source, anyone can access the source code and modify it to suit their needs. This has led to development of thousands of different versions of Linux, known as distributions or distros for short. Another benefit of Linux is its stability and security. Linux is known for being very stable and rarely crashing or freezing. It is also less vulnerable to viruses and other types of malware than other operating systems, making it a great choice for users who are concerned about security. Now you might be wondering how is Linux different from other operating systems like Windows or MacOS? Well, for one thing, Linux is completely free. There are no licensing fees or hidden costs. And because it's open source, you can access the code and if you are smart enough, you can customize it to your heart's content. This has led to development of many specialized versions of Linux for different purposes, such as scientific computing, multimedia production, and gaming. Linux can generally work for much longer periods of time without needing a reboot compared to Windows. This is because Linux is designed to be highly stable and reliable operating system with robust memory management and process handling capabilities. All these reasons make it an ideal choice for servers and other mission critical systems that require higher levels of uptime and reliability. Learning Linux is essential for everyone entering the IT world because it's one of the widely used operating systems in the industry. Since many of the world's servers, supercomputers and embedded devices run on Linux, it's really good to explore how big Linux job industry is. And that's what we are gonna do in the next video. As you already know, there are tons of Linux distributions, but you might be wondering why I am specifically comparing Red Hat versus CentOS. The simple answer is because both distributions are two of the most used Linux distributions in businesses as enterprise Linux. A lot of software companies use these distributions. Recently, Alma Linux became one of the most used Linux distributions in the IT industry as well. But for the purpose of this video, I will give a small comparison about Red Hat and CentOS. Let me start with Red Hat. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is a serious Linux for businesses. The Red Hat source code is free, so you can go there and install it. However, if you want to use Red Hat Linux distribution from Red Hat Incorporated, you have to pay it. It is because when you get Red Hat, you also get technical support from Red Hat Incorporated. Many businesses choose Red Hat because it's very stable and reliable platform. But the problem is that Red Hat is expensive. At this right point, CentOS comes to play. CentOS Linux is an exact copy of Red Hat. So you can think of this way. CentOS downloaded Red Hat source code, compiled it and provided it for free for everyone. The main difference between Red Hat and CentOS Linux is when you use CentOS, you don't get any support. By the way, later on CentOS is owned by Red Hat and this is where they discontinued CentOS Linux. In 2020, Red Hat announced that they will not support CentOS Linux anymore. When CentOS Linux 8 is released, it's expected that Red Hat will support it for 10 years. But then they decided that they will discontinue CentOS Linux. It doesn't affect ordinary users a lot, but if your business runs on CentOS Linux 
and you may be worried about it because it's possible that in the future you can face some problems since CentOS stability and reliability will be under question. The open source community was not happy about Red Hat's decision, therefore they provided Alma Linux, which is open source, forever free enterprise Linux distribution, and it is exactly compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You can go there and start using Alma Linux in your critical applications. Frankly speaking, I would recommend it. Anyway, when Red Hat made a decision, they also announced a new CentOS distribution, which is CentOS 3. What is it? Basically, it's a development platform for Red Hat. Before releasing a stable version of Red Hat, all the changes, new features are developed and tested in CentOS 3 for a while. If everything goes well in CentOS Stream for a while, then the same changes can be implemented in Red Hat. I hope you understand why the community was angry about discontinuation of CentOS. Because CentOS Linux was a stable version, but CentOS Stream is not stable. It is kind of sandbox for Red Hat. Throughout this course, I'm gonna use CentOS Stream 9, which is the last version as of today, but you can also use the last stable CentOS Linux which is CentOS Linux 7. Both distributions are provided by the Google Cloud. Anyway, I tried to give you a better understanding of the difference between CentOS and Red Hat. I hope this tutorial was useful for you. That's it, I'm gonna see you in the next video. Let's learn what a virtual machine is. Virtual machine is a machine which is virtual. And that's it. No, no, I'm just kidding. It was a bad joke actually. But seriously, let me explain what a virtual machine is. Let's take a normal laptop that we are all using. This laptop has hardware such as CPU, RAM, disk and etc. On the top of hardware, we install operating system. Let's say Windows operating system, which controls how applications such as Microsoft Word or Notepad will use these hardware resources. And of course these applications are installed on the top of the operating system. Up until now, everything is okay. But what if you want to use the CentOS operating system? What are you gonna do? The first option is buying the new laptop where Linux operating system is installed. Or you will remove your Windows operating system and then install Linux on the same hardware. And here you are saying that we have dual boot option which allows to run two operating systems on the same hardware. But again it will allow you to run just two operating systems. What if you want to use Ubuntu, CentOS and Windows on the same hardware? This is the reason why virtualization exists. You are gonna have virtualization tool on top of the operating system and on top of the virtualization tool you will install CentOS, Ubuntu or Windows whatever operating system you want. By using virtualization technology you don't need separate hardware for each operating system and we call virtualization technology a hypervisor that allows you to run different operating systems on the same hardware. There are two types of hypervisors, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is actually what I just described. We have hardware resources and then we have host operating system. On top of it we have hypervisor and on top of the hypervisor we install different operating systems. However, in type 1 hypervisor we install hypervisor directly on the hardware itself, which means that hypervisor controls hardware resources directly. We don't need a host operating system and since we install it on the hardware itself, type 1 hypervisor is also called bare metal hypervisor. I hope everything is understandable until now, but you might be wondering why we learn virtualization technology, why it is so important. Well, the first thing is virtualization is one of the most beautiful things that has happened to the IT world. We are gonna hear the concept of virtualization a lot if you work in the IT industry. Since we are learning Linux, we need a Linux operating system to get some hands-on experience. Therefore, we will create a virtual machine which runs Linux distribution CentOS on the Google Cloud platform. It's a cloud platform that allows you to create different instances or virtual machines on the cloud. And most of the cloud providers use type 1 hypervisor to run their infrastructure. 
So when we create a virtual machine on the Google Cloud Platform, we actually create a virtual machine on the physical hardware. And most likely, there are hundreds or thousands of users who create virtual machines on the same physical server that we just created ours. I also would like to tell you a few benefits of virtual machines. The first one is cost saving. You can run multiple virtual machines on a single physical server, which can save you money on the hardware and electricity cost. The second benefit is flexibility. You can run different operating systems and applications on the same physical machine, which can be useful for testing, development, and experimentation. Then we have another benefit called isolation. So each virtual machine is isolated from other virtual machines, which provides a higher level of security and stability. The last benefit is scalability. You can easily add or remove virtual machines as needed, depending on your workload requirements. There are a lot of benefits of virtualization technology, but since it's out of the scope of this course, I just listed a few of them. You can always ask Google to get more examples. But for now, I think that's all about virtual machines. Bye, and I will see you in the next tutorial. Now we are going to activate our free Google Cloud platform. As I said before, throughout this course, we are going to use this Google Cloud platform, which is free and it's also very useful. So it's really good for the beginners. So since we are in the beginning of the road, we are going to use this Google Cloud platform and we are going to create some virtual machines in this platform. So let's just log into our console. So just type console cloud.google.com and click enter. Then you have to provide your email address. This is my email address. When you just log in your console, so it will ask you select the, uh, like you have to agree these terms of service, agree email updates, I don't want to do that. And then agree and continue. As you see that on the top of the screen, you can see it says start your free trial with 300 USD. So this Google Cloud Platform provides us 300 credits, 300 USD credits, like you can use for three months. Now let's just click this activate button. We are going to activate our account. And okay, you just need to select organization. So I am just, I can choose personal project, then agree, continue. So your account type, it's individual for me. Now I'm just going to fill all the details here. Here we have to provide our card details, card number and etc. So, but do not worry about that because we will not be charged until you just upgrade your account manually later on. Because as you see that here it says it is 300 USD credit for free. So after three months, Google asks you to upgrade your account manually. So it will not be upgraded automatically. That is why if you want if you don't want to do your upgrade your account, then you will not be charged. Now I'm just going to fill my card details. Now I just click this start my free trial button. And if you click this continue button, it will verify your account. There will be another browser. By the way, it may happen that you will not see this pop-up window because it depends on how your bank card is configured. For example, for me, when I just click this continue button, it will give me some code and then I have to confirm that code in my phone. So it depends on how your bank card is configured. So you can fill these sections as you want. I'm going to choose, for example, explore uh, websites, maybe uh, virtual machines, of course. And then that's it for me. Uh, we are going to skip it for now. So that's it. We just activated our free Google Cloud Platform account. Next step is to create our first virtual machines in this Cloud Platform. But before that, I would like to show you these begin sections. So here you can see your begin information. 
as you can see that it says I have 313 euros free like it's free and then I have 91 days remaining so it means that I have three months to spend this amount of money so after three months Google asks you to upgrade your account if you don't upgrade your account then you will not be charged and but all your resources will keep will be kept there so if you want to upgrade your account later on then you can access your resources as well now we can create our first virtual machine so we are going to use compute engine and VM instances and you can also enable this compute engine API after you enable your compute engine API you will face this window so here you can create your instance there is also create instance button just click on that now we have to give the name for our instance so for the first time let's just use CentOS. Let's use CentOS one maybe. You can also add labels, but we don't need it right now. And you can choose your region. I think it's really best if you choose the region that near to your country. For example, I will choose uh, let's say Finland. And that's it. So here you can see that there's a series it really doesn't matter but it's good to use this e3 instance and then machine type you can choose medium small micro and you can also choose the bigger ones but for now i think actually the small is enough but let's just choose a2 medium so it will provide uh, from one to two cpu one shared core of course and four gigabytes of memory and display device we don't need to use display device so i'm just not going to enable display device okay here i boot disk so as you see that our name the instance name is centos one type new was persistent disk that's okay size 10 gigabytes so it means your hard disk it's 10 gigabytes and license type free and then image is Debian Gino Linux. So I don't want to use Debian. I will be using CentOS machine. So let's change it. From Debian we can choose CentOS. And as a version we are going to use the latest one which is CentOS Stream 9. So it's okay. Balance persistent is that's okay. And as a size, your hard disk size you can choose uh, whatever you want so 20 it is really enough for our purpose so let's just select it and we have also other like options here like you can choose a lot of default access like it has some default options or maybe you can choose like a lot of access to all cloud APIs but like basically uh, the first one is okay for our purpose and as a firewall rule we don't need to choose any of that so but there will be some cases that we can choose uh, one of these options or we can create our own firewall rule so basically firewall is is a network security system like that monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic like based on these uh, security rules but we don't need to choose any of these options right now now we can just create our virtual machine but before that i would like to show you something as you see that it is right now it is 29 is this means that uh, this is the monthly estimate so basically if your virtual machine runs uh, in a month then it will cost you 29 usd but it will be charged from your free credits but here if you choose the small one e2 small instance then you will see that it's just around 15 USD so it depends how you want to use your virtual machine and based on that you can choose small, medium or large but let's now choose medium so it really doesn't matter in our case but let's just choose medium and then create our virtual machine 
and here also you can see that it creates your VM instance so for me it was just less than 20 seconds in 20 seconds we just created our own virtual machines in this Google Cloud platform now it's time to access or connect our machine so from this drop down menu you can see there are some options but for the sake of simplicity we are going to use SSH so SSH is a kind of network protocol that allows you connect your virtual machine or server so you don't need to know anything right now about this SSH connection but for now we're just going to use this option so just click on this SSH button and it will create a new browser window and it will take around 20 seconds maybe to uh, open your Linux machine a virtual machine is ready so I will talk about this interface in the next lecture but for now I would like to use this uptime command so uptime shows you how long your server is up so right now it says that our server is our or merge virtual machine is up for 15 minutes so right now this uh, Linux machine is running for 15 minutes and you can also see from here like if you select your virtual instance uh, from the monitoring section you can just monitor your virtual machine for example when it's created the CPU usage is around 72 percent but right now it is around the world and it is 27 probably it will be decreased as well and then there are also some additional information like about disk uh, input outputs throughput network packets like if you have some issues with your network then it will be shown here you will see that there are some fluctuations in this graph or network bytes and etc but for now i think that's that's it so we can move to next lecture let's talk about a little bit about linux bash shell but before that what you see here this black window it is just called a terminal so it's a program called terminal emulator and this program just opens a window and lets you interact with the shell but what is shell the shell is a program that takes commands from the keyboard and gives them to the operating system to perform for example last time if you remember we used this command uptime so what does shell do in this case shell just takes this uptime command as an input from the keyboard and then it will give it to the operating system to our linux machine or to our virtual machine and then this linux machine will perform this command the linux will know that if you write uptime command it will automatically show the duration of our linux machine since it is started so right now it says it is up to 13 days so this is just how shell works and shell it's a just program and that provides access to an operating systems component the shell gives the users a way to get inside the system so this is just very simple shell is used to take some commands from your keyboard and then just pass it to the operating system to our linux machine let me clear the screen and we have also one term it is called cli so it's abbreviation of command line interface so it is just a tool it's called command line interface and bash is just one of these command line interface tools we have also a graphical user interface so i will show you this graphical user interface in one of the future videos but it's not that important right now but the most important thing is we need to use command line interface commands if you look at the job description that requires some knowledge of linux so when they say linux they mean that of course you need to know some like general information about how linux works or maybe in some cases they will require some deep knowledge about linux operating systems linux uh, distributions but when they say linux they actually mean that you need to know the command line interface you need to know how command works in linux and you have to be very 
comfortable by using these commands. So we will command line interface. So bash is just one of these command line interface tools. So right now in our terminal, in our shell, we see that uh, we have this name and then we have this sign, at sign, and then another name. So as you already assumed that, as you already guessed that, the first part is just a username. If you just write another command, it's called users and then press enter, it will show in the name of user. So it says Ashkin Udemy one. So it is just username. And then after this at sign, we have CentOS one. So it is our host name. CentOS one is the host name. And how you can know that? Let's just clear the screen. We have another command, it's called host name. If you just run this command, it will show you the host name of your operating system, host name of our Linux machine. Let's press enter. As you see that it says it is CentOS 1. So that is the host name. The other thing is, if you see that we have this tilde sign here. So tilde means that it just displays that it is the home directory of user. So we have another command, it's called PWD and it means print working directory. So it will print the directory that currently we are in. So let's press enter. So it shows that it is home. It's the home directory or maybe let's say that it is just home folder. And after home folder, we have hkinudemy1 folder. So this is our home directory. So tilde means this directory. It is as simple as that. So I think that's it for this video. Now let's learn some popular commands in the next video. Working with the shell is all about working with the command syntax. Throughout this course, we're gonna use a lot of different commands. But for the purpose of this video, I'm gonna use a few simple commands and so that you understand how command works in shell environment. Let's start using ls command. As you already know that ls is used to list all the files in the current directory. So write ls and then press enter. Right now we don't have any files in this directory. By the way, we can also print our working directory using pwd command. So right now we are in the home directory, but we don't have any files in this directory. So that is why we let's just list uh, other directories, other files. I mean, so use ls and under etc, we have a lot of files. As you see that we have a lot of files in this directory, etc directory. ls itself just lists all the files. It doesn't display any other properties of the file. So, but we can also use some options with this ls command to display other properties of the files that displayed here. So let me just clear the screen and we are going to use ls and then we have to put some options. So in order to put options with command, you need to use dash sign and after dash, you have to write your option. Right now we are going to use L option. It is small letter lowercase letter L and then we have to write our directory. So let's press enter. As you see that it displays all the files, but it also shows some additional properties. For example, let's just take alternatives. Alternatives is a directory. Uh, I know that it's a directory. So first of all, the color is different. As you see that it is a blue color. So it is a directory, but the color actually can be different in other shell environments. But the best way to know that if it's a directory, you can just look at here. If we have D, letter D, in the beginning of this row, then it means that it's a directory. These are called permissions, but we are going to learn these permissions in the future. Here you can also see the size of alternatives uh, folder, alternatives directory. So right now it is 4096 bytes, but you can also use another option, which is H option. So using this option, you can display all the files in a more human readable format. So let me just clear the screen. And I'm going to use the same command, same option, 
but we'll have another option h and then our director name and then press enter so as you see that alternatives directory now has 4.0 kilobytes so it's basically 4096 bytes but it will be in more human readable format usually command syntax has three basic parts the command itself its options and its arguments so ls is the command itself and minus l i mean the lowercase letter l is the option and etc directory here is the argument of this command let me show you one more command so it is change directory command let me clear the screen first of all and the command name is cd so cd means that change directory so right now before that let's print our working directory so as you see that it is home hkmutme1 this is our current directory and if i want to go to the etc directory i need to use this command cd so it will change the directory to etc and press enter so as you see that here right now we are in this etc directory but before that we are in the home directory if you remember as i said in the previous video this tilde sign means that it is the home directory under etc directory we also saw that we have alternative directory let's go to that directory using this cd command again so right now we are in the let's just print the working directory we are in the etc directory on the root this former slash is called root but i will explain it in the future right now just you have to know that it is a root directory and under root directory we have etc directory it is a folder let's say and under etc we have alternatives directory i'm gonna go to that directory so cd alternatives and press enter so right now we are in this alternatives directory let's print the working directory again as you see that before this command we are in the etc directory but right now we are in alternatives directory so if you want to go back you can use cd command again but this time you have to use two dot and then backslash and press enter so let's print the working directory you see that previously it was under the alternatives but right now we are in the uh, etc directory and if i do this command again so cd two dots backslash i will go to the root directory let's use pv command again so this is the root directory and if you want to go to the your home directory so you can just use this tilde sign cd and tilde sign because if you remember we say that tilde sign is home directory so cd tilde sign and press enter and let's print the working directory as you see that we are on the home directory of this user called hdnudm1 I'm just going to go to that alternative directory again. So I will be using etc and under etc we have alternatives. Let's print the working directory. Okay, we are under the alternative directory. Let's say that I would like to go back to the root directory. In order to do that, you don't need to use one by one. Just write cd and then two dots slash again two dots slash. It will directly go to the root directory press enter and now let's print the working directory and you see that it is in the root directory that's it for now see you in the next lecture let's talk about alias so what is alias and how we're going to use it alias is a just a command that actually a user can define if it is needed for example if you remember that we have two commands called ls it is used to list the directories let's just list what is under this var directory so i'm gonna use like ls command and then press enter it will just list everything under this var directory we have one similar command as well it is ll if you remember that now let's use this command to list everything under the var as you see that ll is a bit different than ls so it still lists all the directories everything under this one directory 
but it also shows some other properties. It displays permissions, ownership, and also some other stuff about the file. So it's a bit different than LS, but of course the main point is just to list uh, everything under the directories. So, but LL, as you see that LL is different than LS, but actually LL is kind of areas of this LS command. So we can check it. Let's clear the screen. Let's run this LS again, uh, but we have to use var. And let me run LS and then dash, and then we are going to use this option called L. And then press enter. We have to use also this var directory. Uh, by the way, uh, you can go this like one command back using your arrow keys. If you just press this uh, up arrow key, you will get that command that is around like previously. So I get ls uh, dash l and our var directory. And let's press enter. As you see that it is the same with ll command. So ll is just a kind of alias of this ls minus l command ls is the command itself and minus l is kind of it is just an option let me clear the screen and let's do one more time so i'm gonna run this command ls dash l var and then ll again of course we have to use var as you see that they are same they're exactly the same but how can we know that this is the alias of this uh, ls minus l command so you can use alias you can just write alias and it will show all the aliases that you have it is right here as you see that ll equals to ls minus l so they are the just same command actually and keep in mind that some aliases are already provided by default we can also make our own aliases so let me just clean the screen first we already know this pwd command right pwd it will print the working directory so right now we are under the home directory of this user hknu.demova and I'm gonna use alias and I'm gonna name it as hkin, it's my name and then we are gonna like define this hkin as pvd command so for that we have to use this alias command it's the command to create aliases so alias and then you are gonna write your new command name your new command name will be Ashkin, and then write your old command name. So old command is pvd and press enter. So it is just done. We just created alias called Ashkin, and it will just point to the pvd command. Let's see how it works. So if you run pvd, it works great. It, it doesn't matter, like it's not affected. But if you use Ashkin, as you see that it will do the same thing because hkin is, is a just this command print working directory you can also remove your alias so you have to use this on alias command and then just write your new command name and then press enter and that's it if you run this hkin command again you will see that it says command not found in this point i would like to ask you a simple question so imagine that you have a command which is already existed and you want to use that command name for your alias so what will happen in this case well let's see it in practice let's just clear the screen and let's say that we have this command right cd command it is used to change the directory for example i can use cd and then we can go to the etc directory and then if we do pwd we are under the etc directory and if you just write cd itself it will go back to the home directory so this is it. this is how this uh, cd command works but let's say that you want to use this cd name this command name as your let's say that for the listing uh, directories for example cd equals to i'm going to use ls i'd like to point this uh, cd command to the ls command so when I type CD, we don't know it will take the, like it will perform as change directory command or it will perform as a listing command. Let's just create this alias and let's see what is happening here. If I type CD and then I print, 
I mean, I just pressed enter. It doesn't show anything because if you do ls, there's also like nothing in this uh, directory. But if we do cd and then etc, so actually it should go to the etc directory. But if you press enter, you will see that it just lists everything under this directory. Just remember that it's very important. Aliases are executed before anything else. So it means that if you have command, like with the name cd, but you also like made some command uh, with the name cd again, the alias will always execute it first before that cd real cd command. Of course, you can use absolute pass of that command. So we're going to talk about what's the pass in, in the in the future videos. In that case, if you use pass of this uh, chain directory command, then it will be used as this chain directory command. But if you don't use absolute pass of that command, then always aliases are executed before that command. That's all about alias. So let's talk about history command in the next video. Imagine that you had a very long command, like this one. And you used this command, let's say, two hours ago, but you don't remember it now. So what are you going to do? Well, the best possible solution is to look at the history of the commands that you have used previously. The history, we have this history command. It's actually a feature, and it makes a lot easier to repeat complex commands. So let's just type history and press enter. So it will display all commands in the bash history. As you see that since beginning, we have used these commands. You can also search a specific command in the history by pressing Control R. But before that, let's clear the screen. And let's just run one uh, long command. I'm going to use uh, acron command. It is just, this is a command and it is just used to print something in the output of the terminal. So let's say that I'm going to say my name is Eshkin and I'm from Azerbaijan. And that's it. Let's run this command. Now let's run other commands as well, just to have a few commands after echo. So in the bash history, let's say that let's run ls, let's run lsl cd pwd i think it's enough so now let's write history again as you see that in the below we have new commands and then we're going to search specific string for example i mean i mean the command name you have to press the control r and it will open the prompt and then you can just type a string i mean the command name for example uh, let's search for this echo. As you see that it's like it already defines this command. So when you type a string, it will do backward search in the commands that containing that string as the command name or one of its arguments. And if you find it, you can just press enter. It will just run that command. Let's clear the screen. And let's run this history command one more time. As you can see, it displays how many commands that we have in the bash history. There is a number for every command. And right now we have 89 commands that we have used previously. So bash is configured by default to keep the last 1000 commands a user used previously. But let's say that you want to run uh, and, you know, for example, let's say you want to run this pwd command. Like one option is, of course, using this control R and then write a command and it will search for it. Then you can just run it. And another option is, let's run this history command again. So another option is you can use exclamation mark and the command number. For example, I would like to run this command. I'm going to use exclamation mark. And then I'm going to put this number. It is 81. And then press enter. Another point I would like to mention is about removing the history. In some cases, you may want to wipe the bash history. So for that, we can use the C option for the history command. Let's clear the screen. 
and if you type history and then dash and then C, it's going to clean the current history. And if you just press enter, so the history is just cleaned. Now let's use history command. As you see that there's only one command and which is history itself. There are also other useful options about history command that you can Google it if you want. But for now, that's all about the history. A Linux command is a program or a utility that runs on the command line or terminal. In Linux, we have two types of commands, internal and external command. An internal command is a command that's a part of the shell itself. So it means that the internal command is a shell built in. But how can you know that if the command is internal or external? Actually, that's very simple to check. You can do it by using a type command. After type, you just need to write the command name. For example, I would like to look for pwd command. It says pwd is a shell built in, and it means that this command is internal command. We can also check cd command, for example, type, and our command name will be cd. And cd is also a shell built in command, so it means that it's internal command as well. But where these commands are located? Because we say that a Linux command is a program or utility, which means that there should be some files related to these commands. So for that, we can use which command. You have to write which, and after that, you have to provide the command name. For example, let's use pwd again, and it says that this command is located in user main pwd. Let's check the other command, cd. It's also located in user bin directory. Let me clear the screen. And then let's see that what's under this user bin directory. So I'm going to use ls, then user, and then bin. As you can see that we have a lot of files here. And just keep in mind that they are binary files. And also, if you notice that we used user bin. Bin here means that binary. So they are all binary files. Or in other words, we can say that they are all executable files. When you run the pwd or cd command, these binary files will be executed. Let's see where is the pwd file. As you can see that pwd is here and our cd file is here. They are all binary files. The external command is also a command that exists as an executable file on the disk of the computer. When a user runs a command, at first the shell will determine whether it's an internal command or external command. If it's not internal command, it will look for an executable file with a name that matches the command on the disk. Let's see what external commands that we have already used. Let me just clear the screen. And I'm going to check ls command. So type ls. As you can see, it doesn't say that it's a shell built-in command, which means that ls is external command. But where ls is located? So as you already know that, we can use which command. So which, then write ls. And it's also under this user bin directory. And it's in the same directory with cd and pwd commands. There's also one important point about external commands. When we run external commands, Linux goes through a list of directories to search a file name, which is the same as with the command name. And that list is stored in a variable called pass. We haven't learned the variables yet, but we will learn them in this section as well. So let's print these directories. Let's use echo command. You already know this command from the previous videos. So I'm going to use echo, then our variable name. It just prints the pass itself. If you want the command line to interpret the pass as a variable, then you have to use a dollar sign in front of that variable. For example, echo, then dollar sign, then your variable name. Now it displays all the directories. So we say that ls is the external command located in the user bin directory. If you notice that, that, that directory is stored right here. So it is here, user bin directory. When you run the command ls, Linux will search all the directories and it will find ls command in this user bin directory. Then it will execute that ls file. Because if you notice that, ls file is located also under the user bin directory so it is right here i'm just going to clear the screen and run this command one more time but what will happen if we remove this user bin directory from the pass variable so let's remove that directory 
for that we will need to use export command so export let me write it so export is another command that is used when we work with variables we don't need to learn it right now but i just want to show you how the pass variable works so i'm going to use export and then i'm going to copy all these directories and then i will use pass the variable name and the values will be these directories and I'm going to remove this user pool. So let's press enter. If we do echo pass again, as you see that user bin directory is not here. We already removed that directory. And now let's run ls command. I'm going to list the files under this etc directory. Press enter. It says the command ls is not found because we already removed that directory where Alice is located from the path variable. Let's set this path variable one more time. So now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna add here this user bin directory and then press enter. Now let's run this lsxc again. As you see that it just lists all the files. Now ls command works because we just included the directory where this command is located to the path variable. I hope now you understand the difference between internal and external commands. So that's it for now. See you in the next lecture. While we learn Linux throughout this course, we're going to have tons of commands. And those commands are going to have a lot of options. So it's impossible to remember all of them. That's why it's better to get help from Linux. So for that, we have two best choices. Either we can use my command or we can use any command with option help. Let's start from option help. Nearly all commands accept the help option and displays the summary about how to use that command. For example, let's look at ls command. I'm going to use ls and then we'll have to dash and then help. Press enter. As you can see that it provides short overview about this command. It displays what this command does, how to use it and what options can be used with it. So for example, let's look at this option A. It says that option A, do not ignore entry starting with dot. You can use either option A or you can use two dash and then O. Let's clear the screen and let's use that option A. So I'm gonna use LS and then dash. So first of all, without A, let's use just LS, press enter. So right now under this directory, Let's use pwt. So right now we are in the home directory. So under this directory, we don't have any files. At least that is what ls displays. But now let us use ls-a. Okay, now we have some files. So it means that this ls command doesn't work. We have to use option a. But actually it works. Option a just will list all the files. And apart from the normal files, we also have hidden files as well. So that is why it just shows all the files, including normal files and the hidden files. And those hidden files start with dot. You can also just write ls dash dash and all. It will do the same thing again. Let's run help command one more time. ls help. There's also another option I would like to show you. This R option. So it says reverse and it will reverse the order while sorting. For example, let's clear the screen. So let's do ls and etc. It will display the files under etc. You can see that it starts from a and then goes to y. So it will just display the files alphabetically. Now I will use, let's clear it. Now I will use ls dash r option and then etc again. So as you can see, it just starts from the last one. So it will just reverse that order. By the way, just keep in mind that some commands might not accept the help option. In that case, they will display an error message about valid options that can be used with them. And now let's mention man command. Let's clear the screen. Man command is simply your best friend whom you can ask help about the command syntax and its usage. If you don't know how a specific command is used, you can look at the man page of that command. For example, I want to know how the echo command works. So I'm going to use man and then echo, enter. So it just says that echo displays a line of text 
and here you can see how you can use it like echo options and the string that you want to print and then it will give you some options that you can use with this echo command so this is very useful man page and if you want to exit you can just press q on the keyboard and then it will create so these man pages sometimes give a specific example about the command usage for example we have a ch on command which changes the ownership of the files we learn this command when we are going to talk about users and group management but let's say that i don't know how this command works i will just look at the man page so let's do that i'm going to use man and the command name let's press enter as usual it gives a small description and displays some options and in addition you can also see that it will give some examples some specific examples that you can use when it is loaded overall i highly recommend reading some articles about map pages to get a detailed understanding but for the sake of simplicity of this course i will finish right here since you just get a basic understanding of man command let's talk about variables variables are really important because the linux shell environment consists of a lot of variables you can think of variables as a fixed name that can be assigned to dynamic values so in linux we mostly care about environment variables for example if you remember that we have used this pass variable when we are talking about internal and external commands so pass is the environment variable we have a command actually to list the environment variables so we can just use env command env it is just short form of this environment so let's press enter as you can see that we have many environment variables and you can see the pass variable right here so the pass is a fixed variable name and the value assigned to it will be dynamic what it means that for other users the value of pass variable can be different also, we haven't talked about users yet. Keep in mind that environment variable can be different for each user. As you can see that right now, we are asking using one user. Environment command will display only environment variables for this user. If you switch to other user, for example, let's say that asking using to this user, it might be possible that this user will adjust its own pass variable. You can set the environment variable when it is needed. For example, imagine that you are installing Apache Tomcat. Let me just write it. Apache Tomcat. So it's just a web server to deploy Java applications. So in order to set up Apache Tomcat, you need to add some environment variables. One of them is a variable called Catalina Home. Let me write it. Catalina Home. This Catalina Home is just an environment variable which should be pointed to the main Tomcat directory. You should set this environment variable for this user. So let's do that. And let's say that we have installed Tomcat in the home directory. Let me just use pwd. Right now we are in the home directory. And let's say that we installed Tomcat in this directory. And so there will be another directory called Tomcat after this hkinudemi1. And I'm gonna set this Catalina home directory. I mean Catalina home variable. Let's do that. I'm gonna write Catalina and then home. And then we have to use equal sign. Then I'm gonna write home HL Udemy. Sorry, Udemy one. And let's say that after this we have this Tomcat folder. And let's press enter. Now let's run environment command again and search for this new environment variable. I'm searching, I'm searching and searching, but wait, we don't have this variable here. So let's do echo to print this variable. Let's clear the screen. Let's do echo Catalina home. And let's press enter. It doesn't display the value of the variable because we didn't use the dollar sign. So keep in mind that to print variables, you have to use dollar sign in front of it. So I'm going to say echo, let's just write this command again. And in front of it, we have to put this dollar sign. And now let's press enter. Now it prints that value. And let's see that if it is in the environment variables, as you can see that it's not still in the environment variables. 
If you want to set it as an environment variable, you have to export it. We already talked about this export command in one of the previous videos. So I'm just going to export this Catalina home variable. Let's clear the screen. And I'm going to use export. Then I'm going to say that Catalina, then home, and press enter. Now let's look at this environment. Yes, it is right here. And you can see that we just exported. So one more time, if you want to your variable to be in the environment variable section, you have to export it. But what you are going to do if you want to delete the exported variable. So for that, we can use unset command. Let's clear the screen. We have this command called unset. You have to write it. And after that, you have to write your exported variable name. So Catalina, home, press enter. Let's one more time run this environment command. As you can see, it is not here. We don't have this Catalina home variable because we delete that exported variable. For now, you don't have to know much about variables. I'm going to talk about variables a bit more in the bonus section of this course, where I will teach you the basics of shell scripting. So for now, that's all about variables. When you watch YouTube videos or read some articles, you might hear people talking about file systems in different ways. The word file system can have many different meanings. And please do not get confused with that. In this tutorial, we're going to define a file system like that. It's a set of directories defined by the file system hierarchy standard. Since you are using a terminal, it makes sense to explore the Linux file system from a terminal window. So let's start. Let's change directory to root directory. So I'm going to use CD and then forward slash. So root directory is defined with forward slash and then press enter. Use ls to list all the directories under root. And you see that we have many directories under this root directory. There is also a better command to show the directory tree. It's called the tree and we have to use that command. So let's use tree, press enter. So it's not found because we have to install it. I'm going to use gun install tree. Sorry for that, we have to switch to root user. Let's use this command again. You install tree and y option. Use control L to clear the screen. So we have to use this tree command. Let's use tree. First of all, let's go to the root directory. And here, let's use tree command. So what's happening here? seems that it lists all the directories and files on the root, but we don't need it actually. Let's just control C to stop that, clear the screen. But how are we are going to use this tree command just to display only the directories on the root? We already learned that there is also man page for every command. We can use man page of that tree command. So man tree and let's search for some options. Okay, option A, it will, it will list all the files because as a default, it just lists the files. But if you use A option, it will list all the hidden files as well. Okay, I think we have this L option here. So it says that it will display the depths of the directory tree. Okay, I think I got it. What does it mean? Let's use three and then minus L. So it says mission argument to L option. So we have to provide argument. I believe that it should be some number because we're talking about depths of the directory. So it means that if I use two, it will search for two depths, level two, which means that, so for example, var directory is under the root. If you look at ls command, you see that under root, we have this uh, var directory. Let's clear the screen. And if we use L2, it will search for var directory under root. And also under this var directory, it will list all other directories as well. So I think we can use L1. But this is better. Let me just zoom out a little bit. Okay, clear the screen, run it again. So this is better. As you can see, we have many directories under root. So first of all, we don't need to know much about this 
the first directory called AFS. So it is just a distributed file system. But let's start from the bin directory. Let's go to the bin, cd bin directory, and let's run three command here. So we have 765 files here. So bin directory contains binary files or executable files, which are necessary for the operating system. Let's use ls actually. If you remember in the previous section, I mentioned that commands that we use such as pwd, ls, they're all placed in this directory. For example, let's search for pwd. As you see that it is here. There's also one more directory. Let's go back. Let's run three. There is also one more directory called a spin. You may ask that what is the difference between these two directories. So a spin directory also contains executable files, but the difference is that they should only be run or executed by the root user. So if you do ls this a spin directory, you will see that we have also some binary files here. These directories, a spin or bin directory, also share their common libraries, and all these libraries is placed under this lib folder or lib directory. If you ls, you will see that we have some libraries here. You may see different lib directories like lib32 or lib64. So they are kind of used for the same purpose. But the thing is, for example, lib64 will just store 64 bit programs. Since we are talking about binaries, we also have this user directory. Let me list all the files under this user directory. As you see that this directory, it has its own bin or spin lib directories, which also contains executable files that are not necessary for the operating system. And it means that they are intended for the users, for the end users actually. In addition, if you remember in the previous section, we talked about pass variable that contains these directories. For example, if I do echo, then dollar sign, and then print this pass variable, all those directories that we taught, they are all placed here. So when we run any command, it will search for that command within these directories. Then we have etc directory. Let me try it again. So we have this etc directory, which just contains configuration files. If you want to modify or customize your system, this is the directory that you should look at. If you do ls, you will see that we have a lot of configuration files here. We also have a home directory. You see that we have this home directory. As you already guessed, it contains home directories of different users. For example, right now we have only one user. Let's go to this directory. And if you do ls, you will see that we have only one user called HKNU demo one. If there were many users, home directories of those users will be placed here. Actually, we can test it. Although we haven't learned how to add users yet, I just would like to show it to you for the purpose of understanding the home directory. So I'm gonna use user add command. I'm gonna add the user name test. So we just added our user and let's see that if we have the home directory of this user, if you do ls, you will see that we have this test directory here. If you have a lot of users, the home directories of the old users will be placed here. Let's go back and let's do three again. We also have a few other directories such as dev, for example. So dev directory, contains device files. For example, if you do ls, you will see that all the device files here. So what does it mean that if you plug in a new USB drive or new webcam to your Linux machine, a new device will be created here automatically. Let's go back. Then we have a boot directory. You see that above there we have this boot directory. This directory contains files that are required to start your system. So if you don't have advanced knowledge of the Linux, then it's recommended not to touch any of these files. Let me just do ls, this boot directory. 
and you see that you have some files here and you can bridge your machine if you mess up one of these files so that's why it's not recommended to touch these files we also have this uh, optional directory so it's called opt where is that it's here so it it comes from the word optional and it is used to store software that you compiled which means you build the software yourself from a source code so right now there is nothing in this directory because we didn't compile any software ourselves and then you have this var directory or in other word the variable directory it just contains variable files if you do it ls we have some variable files here so those variable files will change during the use of the operating system and this directory is also popular for the log files you will find your log files in this directory for example under var there is this log directory you will find some log files here then you have this tmp directory tmp directory contains temporary files actually this name the tmp also comes from the word temporary so it contains temporary files so linux itself can place temporary files or you can also place some temporary files under this directory so if you do ls for example right now we have some temporary files here like systemd service files and ssh files and etc but why this directory called temporary or tmp because the files under this directory will be deleted after some time so it depends on the linux distribution on some system files under tmp will be deleted after reboot and other systems may have cron jobs that running deleting files older than some number of hours or days let's print all the directories again so we have talked about all necessary directories that you need to know but a few directories still left if you want to learn more about them you can ask your best friend google or you can use the resource that i attach for this lesson in linux everything is a file in the previous video i talked about file system hierarchy and there i mentioned directories actually directories are also a type of file in general linux has three types of files regular files they are the common file type which includes text files images binary files and etc then we have directories which are called folders in the windows operating system they just store the list of file names and the related information as well the last file type is a special file which includes device files let's start creating files for that we're going to use touch command so first of all you have to provide the command itself it's called touch and then you have to give your argument so in this case argument will be file name let's say that our file name will be just file let's create this file and if you do ls it is here if you notice that i didn't give any extension for that file so just keep in mind that linux doesn't care about the file extensions it just looks into the file contents and then will figure out by its own in order to check the file type or in order to determine the file type you can use file command itself for example we just created this file i'm gonna use file command and then i'm gonna give the file name so it is file press enter so it says that this file is empty so it can't determine the file type because the file itself is empty and if you remember we said that it will figure out why it is on but it should look into the file contents and after that it can know that okay this is a pdf file this is a text file or etc you can check another file in the etc directory for example let's use file command and then under etc we have this host file let's press enter file command determined that this file host file is a text file you can also check other file types under the root directory yourself but for now i'm going to talk about this touch command let's say that you want to create a little files uh, their names will be similar for example file 1 file 2 file 3 file 4 there's a way that you can use touch command a lot of times for example touch file 1 touch file 2 touch file 3 and etc but there is also one easy way in order to do that you can use touch command and then you can give your file name and then you have to put two curly brackets and you have to write for example let's say that our files 
will be started from 1 to 10. So I'm going to use 1, then 2 dots, and then just write 10. And if you press enter, it just created the files that starts from file 1 to file 10. If you do ls, you will see that all the files are here. In order to read the contents of the file, you can use cut command. I forgot to give the argument, the file itself, so let's stop that. For example, let's say that I would like to read the file contents of this file 9, for example. Since file 9 is empty, there is nothing to read. But we can read the host file. So under etc, we have host file. Let's use that. And it just reads the contents of these host files. For creating the directories, we can use milk directory command. So let's just clear the screen. We have this command called mkdir. So it means milk directory. You need to write also the argument. So argument will be the folder name or directory name. Let's say that it will be folder. Just folder. Press enter. And if we do ls, you see that it is here. The folder directory is here and the color is blue. So it's just differentiate files from the folders. And if you use ll command from here, you will see that for this folder, in the permission section, we have this D letter. So it means directory. I'm going to talk about these permissions later in the later sections. But just keep in mind that folder has always this the permission so it means that it is it's not actually a permission but it just says that okay this is the directory you can also use the same curly brackets to create a lot of directories let's clear the screen for example make directory i'm gonna say that the file the folder name will be folder and it will start from 1 to let's say 15. press enter if you do ls as you see it's just created folders starts from 1 to 15 like it's here 15 imagine that we need to create folders recursively for example let's say that we have folder called eshkin and under this folder we have another one called eshkin1 and then another one called eshkin2 so we have to create these folders one way is you just use make director command you have to create the first folder eshkin and let's do that. Let's move the cursor to the beginning of the line. For that, you can use Ctrl A. So Ctrl A just moves the cursor to the beginning of the line. And Ctrl E just moves the cursor to the end of the line. So let's press Ctrl A. And then write make directory command. And let's press enter. So it says cannot create directory. No such file or directory. So it means that in order to create this folder, there should be this folder as well and in order to create this folder hkin1 there should be also this hkin folder so this is the parent of this directory and this directory is a parent of the this directory to eliminate this error you have to use one option so it is called p option minus p so it will just create parents if needed let's press enter you see that we don't have any errors, any issues here. If we do ls, so our hkin directory is here. Now I'm going to do, let's, first of all, let's clear the screen. Now I'm going to use three command and display hkin directory. Here it says we have two directories, but actually we have three. The three command just counts the directories, like starting from here. It doesn't count the main one. So, but actually we have three directories. So, the directory one, so it, it is eshkin, and after that we have eshkin one, and then inside this eshkin one we have eshkin two directory. That's all about creating files and folders. In the next video, we're going to learn how to delete, copy, and rename those files and folders. In the previous video, we have just created many files. Now it is time to play with them. The first thing that we're going to do is delete some of the files. For that, rm command is used. rm is a short form of the remove. So we're going to use rm. First of all, let's use 3 command. So right now we have 19 directories and 11 files. So here we have 16 directories 
and here we have three directories as well so in total we have 19 just write rm then you can write your file name so it is just file press enter if we do ls we will see that we don't have this file here because we already deleted it let's use one more time it, this time let's delete the file one so it is deleted it's very simple to use this rm command but what about directories how we can delete some of the directories so let's clear the screen let's do ls one more time we have 19 directories let me delete this folder for that we're going to use rm directory command so remove directory command then you have to put your argument argument will be our directory name so remove directory folder let's press enter if we do ls as you see that we don't have this folder here because it's already deleted if you remember we just created this hbin directory and if we do three hbin as you see that we have three directories here so right now i'm gonna try to delete this directory let's clear the screen and let's use rm directory then folder name hbin press enter it gives us error message that says directory is not empty because under hbin we have two other directories as well we have to keep in mind that this command rm directory is just used to delete empty directories it cannot delete the directories that have some files or some folders under that in order to delete this hbin directory we're going to use rm command but we have one option here called r r means that it will delete the directory recursively actually let's use our, our man page if you do man rm here we have this r option so it says remove directories and their contents recursively let's press q to exit and let's use rm option r and then our directory name press enter so it is deleted it doesn't give any error let's do ls so hbin directory is not here so because it's already deleted i would like to show you one more thing let's try to delete the directories in the root so let's switch to root user let me print the working directory right now we are under root directory so just keep in mind that this is different we have also this forward slash which is root directory itself and then under that we have root directory as well actually this is the home folder of root user so do not get confused with this slash so forward slash means that it's root directory and under root directory we have root user so this is the home folder of home directory of this root user i'm going to create a few directories here let's use p option and let's use test test one test two and test three okay it was just a typo but it doesn't matter actually let's do three then test one so we have test one test two and test three now i'm going to try to delete these test one directory using this r option give the directory name and let's press enter it's asking for confirmation to descend into directory test one since r option is used to delete directories and its contents recursively it will start deleting the directories from the last one so here it will move to the last folder let's just press y it means yes press enter then it asks again to descend into directory test 2 let's press y again now it asks for confirmation to remove directory test 3 so this is just pass off this test 3 directory if you put y here it will remove this test 3 directory let's put y and press enter so right now test 3 is deleted now it asks for confirmation to delete test 2 let's put y again press enter okay it's deleted and now we have just this folder left test one let's put y or maybe let's put n it means no and press enter and if we do three again test one you see that there is only test one because we already deleted these two directories 
but this one is left. If we put Y here, then it will delete this test1 directory as well. It usually asks for confirmation when you are root user. As a normal user, you don't need to provide these confirmations. But if you are root user, then it will start asking for some confirmations. However, if you don't want to confirm every time, then you can use the F option. Let me just show it. Let's clear the screen. Let's do man rm. Here we have this F option. This option will force deleting directories recursively without asking for confirmation. Let's test it. I'm going to create again some folders. Let's say ishkin1, ishkin2, and ishkin3. Press enter, ls. Okay, it's here again. We have a typo here, but it doesn't matter. If you do 3, ishkin1. So we have three directories here. Now I'm going to use rm, then r option for the recursive method. And then we're going to use f option for the force deleting. And then we're going to provide this folder name. Press enter. It didn't ask for any confirmation. If we do ls, hkm1 directory is already deleted. Okay, that's it for this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we're going to use text editors. In the last video, we haven't talked about copy and move operations for files and folders. So before looking at the text editors, let's learn how to copy and move in Linux. You're going to need to often copy the files like you do in Windows or macOS. We have a command in Linux called cp, which helps us to do copy operations. So let's do that. But before that, I'm going to look at the man page of this command. By the way, you should really learn how to use man pages. Because in the future, if you want to take an exam related to Linux, then you will not be allowed to use the internet. In Linux, there are a lot of commands which are really, really long. So you don't need to remember all of them. But you can use the man pages or help commands to just remember or learn how to use that specific command. So but anyway, let's see the man page of cp command. So basically, we have the command. And then after that, we can use options if needed. And then we have source and destination. So first of all, we need to provide the command option. Then we need to provide the source directory and then destination directory. Let's press Q to create that. So I'm going to copy the files under the etc directory to the tmp directory. Let's use cp command. Then under etc, we have these files called shells. So this is our source directory. And then we're going to have our destination directory, which will be TMP. Let's press enter. And then list the TMP directory. So as you see that we have shells files here. So we just copied the shells under etc to TMP directory. Let's see that what directories or files we have. I'm going to copy etc shells to, let's say, folder 3 directory. So folder three, and let's list the folder three. So we have shells file here. We can also change the file name while you are copying. So let's use the same command again, but this time I'm gonna say that file name will be my shells. Press enter. Let's do it. Let's folder three. You see now we have two files, and if we read them, so first of all shells. Oh, sorry, we have to use folder 3. So folder 3 and shells. So you see the contents, it just lists the, all the shells. And then let's read my shells. I'm just going to show you they are the same files. You see that the contents are the same, but we just change the file name while we copy that file. Now I would like to copy the shells file again to the let's say folder 33 but actually we don't have this folder we just have folder 3 not 33 let's press enter and see what happens and i'm gonna do ls so again we don't have this folder 33 but instead of that we have folder 33 file 
as you see that it's not a folder because if it's a folder it should be blue color but right now it is in white so it means that it's a file you can also check like that for example folder 33 you see that it's a file and if we do folder 3 it said sorry okay um, I'm going to use the option so folder 3 is directory you see that we have this uh, directory permission or not a permission but it just displays that it's a directory but for folder 33 we don't have that D so that's why it's a file as you already noticed if the target or destination directory doesn't exist the file will be created with the name of intended target directory so often you don't want to do that and therefore you need to put forward slash after the directory name for example I'm gonna use the same copy command but after that I'm gonna put slash if we press enter now it gives us error message that says fail to access folder 33 which means that this directory doesn't exist actually as we already mentioned in the beginning we can also use some options with this cp command one of the most common options is r which stands for recursive let's clear the screen so we have this r option it stands for recursive it helps you to copy the entire subdirectory with everything under it so i'm going to use this option so cp minus r or dash r i'm going to copy etc directory to let's say folder 2 we have this folder 2 in this path so let's press enter okay we have something wrong here it says it cannot access some of the files because etc is under the root and this user cannot access that files that's why some files are not copied to this folder 2 but let's clear the screen and let's do ls folder 2 press enter so we have etc directory and if we do etc here we have some files are already copied to folder t under uh, folder 2 sorry under etc i mean we just copied full etc directory to folder 2 but i'm gonna use ll and d option for directory and this folder 2 we have etc so right now it has 4096 bytes but if we do the same thing for the real etc directory we're gonna see that the real size is 9192 bytes so it is because we have less size here it's because of that we couldn't copy some files because they're not root user now i'm gonna switch to root user now as a root user let's copy etc directory to folder one of that hpnudim one user i'm gonna use cp sorry dash r and we're gonna copy etc to folder one for hpnudim one user of course so folder one let's press enter as you see that it didn't give us any error now let's do ll minus d so i'm going to check this folder one the size of folder one so it will be hpnudim one folder one press enter uh, sorry not folder one but we want to get the size of etc so right now the size is 8000 it is the same with this etc directory under root actually there are of course other options as well but we don't need to know all of them right now we're gonna use them if needed during the course but for now let's talk about move command the second command is mv it's called mv it stands for move so basically to move files and directories you use this command it's very simple actually i'm gonna clear the screen let's do ls before that let's switch to hpnudim one user actually okay so now i'm going to do ls i want to move file let's say 10 to the folder 10 but before that let's check if we have anything under folder 10 
so folder 10 we don't have anything so let's move file 10 to folder 10 it is moved and let's do ls folder 10 again so we have file 10 if we do ls here you will see that we don't have file 10 here because you already moved that file from this location to the folder 10 location you can also move folders as well for example let's move folder 10 to folder 5 but before that let's see if we have anything under folder 5 we don't have anything so i'm going to use remove folder 10 to folder sorry folder 5 we're gonna move folder 5 to folder 10 okay now let's do a list folder 5 okay we don't have this folder because we already moved that folder to folder 10 let's do a list folder 10 right now we have file 10 and folder 5 so this is one of the simplest command that you can use but you will often see that a lot of people use this command to rename the files and the folders as well so in fact it is just copying and deleting the original file i'm going to show you this for example if we do ls let's clear the screen so we have let's say folder 15 right so i'm gonna rename this folder i'm gonna use folder and then if i want to rename that file i'm just going to write new name so let's say that it will be my folder 15 let's do ls so right now we don't have folder 15 but instead of that we have my folder 15 so what happened here move command just copy it folder 15 to my folder 15 and then it just deleted the original folder which is folder 15 so i think that's it about copy and move operations see you in the next tutorial i would like to mention one more time that in linux everything is a file to edit files on terminal there are different text editors that you can use but vi editor or visual editor is the most popular text editor for Linux because it's available in almost all Linux distributions. There are some versions of VI Editor, but Vim is mostly used by Linux users. Vim stands for VI Improved. Let's see how it works. The command used to open a file is Vim. I'm going to write Vim and press Enter. It just opens a blank file and it gives some information about Vim. By the way, helping is always caring, so you can always help pure children in the world. So we have some types here. For example, it says that to exit the file, you can just write semicolon and Q. So I'm going to write semicolon and Q and press enter. So it's just exit the file without saving anything. By the way, if you use B instead of Vim, press enter, you will see that as a default, when you type V, it will open actually Vim. I mean, it will use Vim versions of VI editor. I'm gonna exit, I'm gonna quit, and I would like to create a new file, or maybe before that, let's clear the screen. For example, let's say that we are going to open this, uh, let's say folder 33. This is a file, right? Because we created in the previous video. So I'm gonna use Vim, and then folder 33, and press enter. So this is the content of our file and you will see a lot of tilde signs so tilde denotes unused lines and in the bottom left corner you will see the file name which is folder 33 and 4l means that we have four lines as you see that here we have four lines and 44b is for like the size is 44 bytes the vim editor has two modes the command mode and the insert mode so right now we are in command mode in this mode you can copy cut and delete the text and save your changes for example if you press the d key two times it will delete the current line so right now we are in the first line i'm gonna press two times the letter so you will see that the first line is already deleted what's important is here that you just need to remember that the commands are key sensitive for example we have command a with small letter and the command a with big letter as well but now let's switch to insert mode and add some text 
So to switch to insert mode, press I and you will see the notification in the bottom left corner that you are in insert mode. So let me write some text. Let's say that, let's go to the end of the line. So I'm gonna write, hi, I am Ashkin. I am from Azerbaijan. If you want to save this file, you need to switch to the command mode. So you cannot do it while you are in the insert mode. To do so, you need to press the escape key for civilization from insert mode to the command mode. To save this file, I'm gonna press escape key and then write colon and then just write W and then Q. W is used to write the changes and Q is for quitting after saving. And now let's press enter. So it already saved the file and quit. So I'm gonna read this file again. So as you see that we have three lines and the last line that we just added. There's also another way to save and exit. So let me just open the file again. Let's say that we are going to the insert mode and add some additional text. Let me just write, what about you, for example. And then in order to save the file, as you said before, you can just write colon WQ. And instead of that, you can also just press shift and ZZ. But of course, if you are in the insert mode, first of all, you have to go back to the command mode where by pressing escape key. And after that, you can do shift ZZ. So it's just saved and exit. So let's read that file again. So our line is there. I'm gonna clear the screen. I'm going to open that file again. While you are in the command mode, you can also press all letter, which will open the new line and go to the insert mode. There are a lot of commands to be used with Vim editor. And since they are case sensitive, you can do undesirable changes to your file if you press the wrong command. That's why in the resources, I'm going to provide you a list of commands that you can use with Vim. But for now, let's quit this file and create a new one. So I'm going to just colon. So before that, we're going to jump back to command mode, then the colon, then chip. It gives a warning that there is no right since the last change. So we pressed all letter, which just added a new line, but it was a blank line. We didn't write anything in that line. So therefore it says that there is no right. So that's why if you want to overwrite this, you can just write colon, true and for the overriding you can use exclamation mark and then press enter so it's already overrided now we're going to create a new file we already used the touch command in the previous videos where we created files another way is to create a file is to use vim editor we will write vim the command name and then we will provide a new file name for example let's say it will be my file and if you press enter it just opens this blank file named my file and you will see that in the bottom left corner it says it's a new file and if you do not save it if you exit with q this file will not be created if you do ls you will see that there is no file named my file but if you save it let's do vim my file let's write something i don't know and then go back to the command mode then save so WQ, press enter. If you ls again, you will see that it's here. My file is created. So this is another way to create the files. That's all about VI editor, but don't worry because we're gonna use this editor a lot, really, really a lot. So you will feel more comfortable while you are working with a theme. Sometimes you will need to backup your files. Imagine you are asked to make some changes to your etc directory, but you did something wrong and now you want to roll back to the default or previous version of etc directory. If you didn't get a backup of your etc directory, then you will be frustrated because you wouldn't have the old version of etc. Therefore, it's always better to take a backup of some files or folders before you start working on them. To create backup or to create archive files, we're going to use tar command, which is a tape archiver utility. 
For example, let's create an archive of etc directory. So we have etc directory on the root. I'm going to take a backup of this directory. So I'm going to use tar command. And to create the archive file, we're going to use C option. And then we have to provide the file name. So we're going to use F option. Then let's say that our file name will be etc backup dot tar. As you already know that in Linux, everything is a file and you don't need to provide any extension for that. But it's always best practice to use that tar in the end of your tar files. After the file name, we have to provide the pass. What pass we are going to take a backup. So it will be etc. Then just press enter. Okay, we are getting a permission denied error. So because we are just taking a backup of etc, which is under root. So that's why we are going to use sudo, or maybe you can switch to root user. Then you can just run the same command again. So there will be no problems. Let's run this command. So right now you don't need to pay attention to this warning. It's not that important. So let's check that if the file is created or not. Let's do ls. Okay, it is here. etc backup .tar. Our file is here. By the way, let's say that there is no .tar extension in the end of your file, but you can still check the file if it is tar file or not. If you remember in one of the, our previous videos, we have used file command. It will determine if the file is tar or not. So let's do file etc backup .tar and press enter. So it will say that it's a tar archive. I would like to use v option in the tar command. So I'm going to use this tar file. And let's create the tar file again. But this time we are going to use v option. So v means verbose. And we are going to see what files we are archiving. So let's press enter. OK, it is done. As you see that under etc, we have a lot of files or folders. Anyway, let's clear the screen. We use this command. Just remember that C is creating the archive file. File F option is just provide the file name and we use V for the verbose. Let's say that after creating a tar file or before extracting a tar file, you might want to read or list the contents of the tar file. So in order to do that, we're going to use the T option. What we're going to do is let's just clear the screen and list the directories. We have etc backup.tar. So I'm going to use tar command, then T for the reading the contents of the tar file. And then we're going to provide F to just write the file name. So our file is etc backup.tar. And when I press enter, it will just read the contents of tar file. Just remember that it doesn't extract anything. It just reads the files. Let's press enter. Another interesting command is to use this T option is word count. So let's say that we are going to read the etc backup.tar contents. But here I want to use piping. So I'm going to count the lines of the output of this command. Also, this part is related to redirection or piping, which we're going to learn in the next section. But I think we can still use it here. You just need to know that we're going to count the lines or we're going to count the rows of the output of this command. So basically, the output is these files. And we are just going to count the lines, how many lines we have in the output of tar command. Let's press enter. Under ATC, we have 902 lines. So it might differ in your case. Maybe you have 3000. It doesn't matter. So anyway, we managed to create and read tar files. Now it is time to extract the tar file for, let's say, restoring our ATC backup. This is very simple, actually. We are going to use tar. And then as an option, we're going to use X. X stands for extracting. And then, of course, we're going to provide the F option to just write the file name. It is a backup.tar. And 
but before that let's just list all the files we have so right now we have etc backup that tar file but we we didn't extract it yet so we're gonna use this tar command so xf and then your file name and then press enter that was very quick and if we do ls again we see that it's extracted here so we have etc directory here and if you do ls for this etc we're going to see that we have all the files but sometimes you may also want to extract the files to a different directory so you can do that as well let's check what we have under tmp okay under tmp we have some files some data i'm gonna extract our etc backup.tar file to this tmp directory so we're going to use tar xf and then our file name and then we are going to use the big c option and then we are going to provide root directory that we would like to extract to so it will be tmp and let's press enter this is done let's check tmp so we have etc directory here that's pretty much about our command in the next video let's learn how to compress the files while archiving them to make your archives take less disk space you may want to compress them to their smallest form and for that there are some compression tools the popular utilities are gzip or bzip2 they're just encryption algorithms and these days they don't make much difference in file sizes right now we have this etc backup.tar and if we check the size of this file so it's around let's say 20 megabytes and i'm gonna compress this tar file i'm gonna use first of all gzip so gzip then we are gonna provide the file itself press enter it's already compressed let's check nslr As you see that it's already added another extension like that gz so it's for gzip so it means that it's a compressed file and right now the size is 4.4 megabytes so before it was 20 and we just compressed it and the smallest form is 4.4 now let's use bzip2 let's see that if there are any difference or not so but before that I'm gonna remove this etc let's create the tar file again so we're gonna use cf options by the way you don't need to use this dash sign with tar command you just can write this way cf and then we are gonna provide the file name so let's say etc backup.tar and the directory press enter let's check okay we have the tar file it was 20 megabytes and i'm gonna use bzip2 utility to compress that file press enter okay it says bzip2 command not found because as default it's not installed we're gonna install it so let's use yum install bzip2 okay sorry we have to use sudo of course say yes it's done let's check i mean let's just compress the file so bzip2 etc backup.tar press enter it is compressed let's do lsl harsh now we have this bz2 extension it's not really extension but it's just uh, something in the end of the file and the size is 0 0.6 but with gzip it was 4.4 so we have 0 0.8 megabyte less here but it's not that much big also if you want to extract this compressed file you can use b unzip2 for the bzip and for the gzip you can use actually 
gun zip but we already created compressed file using bzip so let's use bun zip and then just write your file name press enter let's do ls lh so now we have etc backup.tar so now it is 20 megabytes and then after that you can just use tar command to extract it so tar exif and you're gonna provide the file name press enter let's do ls so it is here we just extracted this tar file to this etc directory this is all about using gzip and bzip utility but there's another way to just use these compression tools we can actually use them with tar command itself we just need to provide one option so i'm gonna use this tar file and let's use actually let's click etc also now let's create the tar file we're gonna use c option to create the tar file and then for the key zip we're gonna use z option and then if for the file name let's do etc backup that star for example press enter sorry but you have to provide the directory that you want to create archive of so let's press enter now okay permission denied because we have to use sudo here night is done if i do ls so the file is created here let's do nslh to see that if it is compressed or not and you see that it is easy that's why it is 4.4 megabytes so it's already compressed we can also use basic utility so we're going to use tar c for the basic we are going to use j and then f for the file name let's do etc sorry etc backup and for example bzip.tar and let's press enter okay we have to provide the directory and also we need to use sudo here press enter and now let's do ls hash again so we have two files this is for the gzip and this is for the pzip we can also easily extract them for example we are going to use tar command again so x let's say that we want to extract this gzip file so we are going to use that option then f then provide the file name press enter it is done we have etc directory here now let's remove this directory vtc and this time let's extract the other files bzip files so we are going to use j option jf and provide your file name press enter if we do ls so it is is here as you see that it's very simple to create and extract the zip files so that's pretty much it about compressed files we are gonna learn how to use links in linux but before that we have to know what's inode or index node every file in linux has an inode so in simple term we can say that inode contains administrative or let's say metadata about files but what's administrative or metadata well basically it's everything but the file name and its contents so inode contains all the information such as file size file type permissions owner information number of links and etc but it doesn't contain a file name so basically inode is something like an id card without a name written on it there's one more thing that inode contains is inode number so i'm gonna create a few files here let's see that we don't have any files so let's use touch command and then write files let's say that there will be 10 files a little command displays the one will thing and basically it is the alias of ls minus l so if we use i option we can see the inode numbers of the files we have to use ll and then provide i option now we have additional column here 
that shows inode numbers. We don't need to know much about inodes, but for the sake of simplicity, we can say that inodes just point to the sum storage blocks in our storage devices, for example, hard disk. In your hard disk, there is a space that will be reserved for the inode when you create a file. And the inode contains the permissions, the file size, the user, the group, the timestamps, and etc. If you look at the file size, you will see that it is zero bytes, but actually all this information takes some space. The file size is zero because all administrative information is rich into inodes, which points to some storage blocks in your hard disk. So it's really important to understand inodes, so you can do some research on Google. But for this course, this tutorial is more than enough to get some information about inodes. So in the next video, we're going to use links and see how they are related to inodes. Now let's learn what hard links are. I'm going to create a new file. So we have 10 files here. Let me create one more file. But before that, let's delete all of them. So we can use star sign to delete all the files. Okay, they are deleted. So I'm going to create a new file called, let's say, bugx.site, which is, by the way, my website name. So we just created this file called bugx.site, which is actually a hard link. This name is hard link. So it's pretty simple. When you create a file, you give it a name. And basically, that name is hard link. Now let's create another link to this file. But before that, I'm going to add some content to the original file. Let's use Vim for this one. So Vim by this is that site. And I'm going to add, for example, let's say hello, escape, shift, that's it to save the file. In order to create a link, we have to use ln. ln is a command. Then we have to provide our original file name, which is by which is that site. Then after that, we are going to write the new name. I mean, new hard link. So it will be link, let's say the link and to IX, for example. Press enter. But let's use this I option as well. So as you see that we have the same I not numbers. So it means that when you create a hard link, the I not number will be the same. Actually, these files are the same. If you look at these permissions, the users, the group, the timestamp, the, all the things are the same. So basically, it's something like they're just copy of each other. And this number shows the number of hard links. So right now, we have two hard links. That's why it is two. I'm going to create a new one. So let's use Ellen again, our original file name. And let's say that it will be link to two bugs. So now we have three files, and there is no difference among these three hard links. They are all just hard links. But what happens if we delete one of them? Let's delete the original hard link. So I'm going to use rm, and original one is bugs.site, press enter. It is already deleted. As you see that nothing happens, just this number is decreased by one. So before it was three, because we had three hard links. Right now, we just deleted the original one, so now it is two. And we can still read the contents of these hard links. For example, let's read the second hard link. So nothing will be broken if you delete one of the hard links. You can think of hard link as a copy of the original hard link or the file. But when you copy a file, it means that you just create a different file, but with the same content. So let me just copy one of the files. So I'm going to say cp then let's copy the this file for example and the target name will be copy let's say test press enter if you do ls li so we have three files and let's do some changes for example let's do this one i'm gonna add some contents so hello there and if we read the copy test so it is hello there and if we read the, for example link to let's say it's not there it means that the file which we just copied is a different file but if i add some content to one of the hard links so let me use 
first I mean this one let's write hello there three exclamation mark and if you read this file link to so hello there three exclamation mark and if you read the first one it's also there which means that they are the same files let's clear the screen we have created the hard link to a file now let's create it to directory so first of all i'm gonna remove all the things here so we have nothing i'm gonna create a new directory called test and let's create hard link from this test directory so we're gonna use ln test and then let's see link to tests as you can see we are not allowed to create a hard link to the directory so this is just something that you need to remember when you create some hard links in general links are pretty useful because they allow you to create links in different locations so that your file will be more accessible but anyway that's it about hard links in the next video we're gonna learn soft or symbolic links i'm pretty sure that you know what a shortcut is in windows you can think of a soft link in linux as a shortcut in windows you will often hear symbolic link or sim link rather than soft link therefore i suggest remember it as a sim link so sim link is just a pointer to the original file so let's do some practice i'm gonna create some file so let's say that it will be udemy and then add some content here In order to create soft link or symbolic link, we have to use again alien command and we have to provide this as option. Then let's use our file name with me and then let's say that it will be as link, for example, symbolic link one to Udemy. Press enter. If you pay attention to the inode, you will notice that they are not the same. You see that this is 92 and this is 91 basically as we already said a symbolic link is just a shortcut of the original file but in hard links i nodes are the same and here also you can see that this is the soft link symbolic link that points to this original file which is udemy and if you read the contents of this symbolic link it's just a link you'll see that the contents is there now I'm going to create sim link in different location. Let me clear the screen. First of all, I'm going to delete this test directory. Sorry for the directory we have to use are in directory. Now I'm going to create a new directory called folder. And I'm going to create a link from Udemy. And the link name will be, let's say, test. And under test, we have to create a new file. So a new link actually. So it will be, let's say, slink2 to, to Udemy. Press enter. Okay, something is wrong here. So sorry, I used test folder, but there is no test folder. The name is actually folder. So I'm gonna do again. But this time here, I should write folder. Okay. Let's press enter and let's do it is rely to the folder directory. It seems like our link is created, but the point is why this one shows red, why it's red. So you have to keep in mind that if it is red, it means that the link is broken. And if you read this symbolic ring, so I'm going to use cut folder and then S link. It says no such file or directory. So this is a bit weird because sim links tend to like full pass. It's always recommended to use full pass when creating sim links. So instead of this command, if we used something like this, for example, but before that, let me show you the current directory. So the current directory is home HDMI one. So I'm gonna use this command again. But this time I will copy the this directory, paste it here. Under this we have Udemy and here as well. 
so we have this home directory under home directory we have folder and under that we have s link to to within but this time let's use link 3 and press enter so it seems like it's created if you do lsli to the folder as you can see that s link 3 is okay it's not broken so let's read that link so it will be s link 3 but it's under folder s link 3 we can read that link so it means that it is created so it's working by the way i believe that i already mentioned in one of the previous tutorials that you can use tilde sign for the home directory pass for example if you use this command so instead of this pass we can just type tilde here as well so tilde means that it's your home directory pass let's say let's just remove it i mean replace it with four press enter and if you do lsli folder so simulink 4 is also created it's not that important i just would like to remind you that we can use this tilde sign instead of your full pass of the home track sorry so i guess that's it about simlinks see you in the next tutorial the first simple command to show file contents is cat which we have already used a lot it's a useful command if you want to read the short file contents because it displays the file content on the terminal for example i'm gonna read the shells under etc the shells file is very short file so let me use a bit longer file such as for example let's say profile under etc so i'm gonna use let's clear the screen and i'm gonna use etc and under etc we have this profile file so let's just press enter right now we are just seeing the last lines of the file if we go a little bit up and we're gonna see the full content you can also use the tag command which is the opposite of the cat to get the inverse result so it means that you will see the first lines not the last lines for example i'm gonna clear the screen and this time we're gonna use the command and then let's read the same file now we are seeing that it displays lines from the beginning of the file so this is the beginning of the file and then if you go up you're gonna see the last lines but what if the file content is too long let's try to display the content of the log messages with cat command because usually log files are used to be too long so we're gonna clear the screen and let's use cat and log messages is placed under the var directory so we're gonna use a var log and under log we have messages press enter of course it gives permission denied error because you have to switch to root user or you can also use sudo so i'm gonna use again cut var log messages so this is the content of that messages file and you see that it is too long and i think it seems so messy and it's not definitely a good way to display long files so actually the better choice is to use less or more command let me clear the screen and we're gonna use the less command to read the same file the less command displays the file content starting from the beginning and you can use the page up and page down command or keys to read the content page by page or you can also use your mouse to just scroll it another useful part of this command is that we can easily search for specific content for example let's say that you want to search for the word linux on this page so we're gonna type forward slash to just switch to the let's say search mode and after that we're gonna type the content that we want to search for example i'm gonna write linux and if you press enter it will just highlight the word linux by the way just a small note this search method 
also works in Vim text editor. So let me just press Q to exit this last page. And uh, I'm gonna use the Vim. For example, let's say we're gonna read the shells under ATC. So I'm gonna use the same thing. So we're gonna type forward slash. And after that, we're gonna write the word that we want to search. For example, let's search bash. As you see that it highlights the word that we want to search. So that's basically the same. I just want to let you know that we can use the same method in Vim text editor. There is also another command called more. So frankly speaking, there is not much difference between these two commands. Let me just read the same file. So we're going to use one log messages. We can also use page up and page down keys to read the contents. But what I like about more command is that in the bottom left corner, there is percentage, which tells you how much the file has been read by the more command. So that's really useful. Otherwise, both more and less commands have many similar features. So I think that's it for this video. I will see you in the next tutorial. Sometimes you will need to display just a few lines of the file. So you might need to see the just first five or last five lines of the file. For this purpose, head and tail utilities are really useful. Their names already give some ideas as to which one shows the first lines and which one shows the last lines. So let's start with head command. Head will display the first 10 lines of the file by default. So I'm going to use head and under ATC we have this file profile. Press enter. These are the first 10 lines of this file. We can also specify the exact number of lines using option N. So we're going to use the same command, but now we're going to use N option. Let's say that we want to see the first five lines and then press enter. So it displays the first five lines and you can also ignore this N option by the way. Sorry, it gives some warning or let's say errors because we have to use dash sign as well. The second command is tail. The tail command is an inverse version of head. So they have almost the same options. For example, you can use the tail to show the last 10 lines of the file. So press enter. So this is the last 10 lines. And you can also use option. Let's say that minus n and the last five lines let's say and of course you can also ignore this in option sorry we have to use dash sign as well so this is how it works in the last tutorial we have used less command to look at the messages i mean the log messages however to observe the live logs tail command is the best option i use it every day to just look at the logs at work now we have two terminal windows because we're going to see the logs in one of the terminals and the other terminals we are going to use to switch the users. If you look at the man page of this command, I mean the tail command, you will see that we have this option called F, which stands for follow. It means that it will output appended data as the file grows. So what does it mean actually? Let me just commit it. Let's say that in the first terminal, I'm going to look at the logs. So we're going to use F option. And then under var, we have a log. And under that, we have these messages. I'm going to look at these messages. Press enter. Sorry, we have to switch to root user. Let's use it again. So tlf var log messages. So these are the just log files are written to these messages. Now I'm gonna do some activities in this terminal window and then we're gonna see the changes in the first terminal. I'm gonna switch to root user in the second terminal and you will see the changes in the first terminal. So let me just use su dash and if I press enter in the first terminal you will see there are some changes. So press enter you see that it says started hostname service. And if you look at the date, so dates are correct. And let's switch to hpnudm1. And look at the first terminal as well. 
So it says it switched to HPNUDMU1 user. This is the correct way to look at the logs. It's also possible to display just one specific line, let's say such as line 34, by combining head and tail utilities, but we'll do it after we learn piping in this section. I think for now I'm gonna end this video here and we'll see you in the next video. The cut command is useful when you want to extract specific fields from the text files. We have a file under etc called passwd. Let me show you. So let's use cat etc and passwd. When we create a new user in Linux, it will be added here. And this file gives information about users. You don't need to know much about this file right now. But don't worry because we're gonna explore it when we start learning users and groups. But anyway, let's say that if you want to see a list of users in the etc passwd file, you can use the cut command to filter out the field, which is the first one, by the way, here in this file, the first field is the users, which contains the names of the users. So in this file, there are several fields with different information and the cut command allows you to select only the ones that you are interested in. So I'm going to show you this cut command. So if we're going to use cut, then we have to provide option F. F is for specifying the field that you want to extract. So in this case, it is one, which is the first field that contains the users. Then you have to provide a delimiter, which is a separator. So I'm going to use option D. And what do you think? How is the first field separated from the second column? Of course, as you see that there is this delimiter, which is colon. So I'm going to use this colon. And after that, you just need to provide your file. So it is pass VD. Let's press enter. Now it gives you all the users. As you see that it starts from root and ends with HPNUD move on. And if you look at the file itself, so the first one is root and the last one is HPNUDM1. So that's correct. Maybe you want to filter out the last field. So this field displays the user's shell information. So let's just filter out this field. So first of all, we need to know that the number of the field. So let's count it. So this is one, then two, then three, then four, and here we have also, actually right now we don't have anything here, but this is the another column. So it will be five, then six, the home folder. Then this one is the last one and which is seven. So I'm gonna clear the screen and let's use seven here. So it shows the shells information about all users. And if you look at the file again, as you see that it starts with this bin bash and ends with bin bash as well. So the last one is bin bash and the first one is bin bash as well. So this is correct. So that's it about cut command. As you see that the cut command is really simple, but at the same time, it's really useful. So that's it about this video. I'm going to see you in the next video. If you remember, I told you that we can display a specific line on the terminal by combining head and tail commands, but for that we need to learn piping. In very simple terms, piping allows us to use more commands together. It is used to send the output of one command to another command by using a pipe character. For example, let me use ls-l here to see that what we have actually in this directory. So we have five files and six lines. By line, I mean the output of ll command displays six lines. One, two, three, three, four, five. And this one is six lines. And now I want to number this command output so that it will show line numbers in the output as well. We have command named nl. It's written like that, nl, which stands for number lines. Let's see man page of this command. So we have to use man nl. It says nl is used to number lines of the file. Let's quit that. I'm going to use ls minus l again. Here we have countries.txt file. 
I would like to show the content of this file, so I'm going to use cat command and countries.txt. This file contains a list of countries. To number the lines of this file, I can use nl command. So I'm going to use nl, then we have to provide countries.txt define it. nl command displays the file content, but it also numbers the lines. So basically, if you use nl command, you need to provide the file as the output to this command. It means that this is the command and this is the file that we have to provide to this command. But what if I want to number the lines of output of nl command? So I mean, we have used this command, right? I would like to send the output of this command, which is this one, so output is this. I would like to send this output to nl command. For that, we have to use piping. What I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna write the command again, and then we have to use piping, the piping character, and then we have to provide the command. So it says we have six lines. What happened here is that the output of ls-l command is used as an input to nl command. So imagine that this is the our file content, and we just provided this file content to this command. So output of this command, which is this one, is sent to the input of this nl command. Or maybe you just want to see just the total number of lines. So in this case, we can use the word count command, which we have already used in one of the previous tutorial. So let's create a screen. I'm going to use ls-l again. And then we have to use this Python character. And then we have to use word count command dash l. L means that it will show just lines, number of lines but the total number of lines, which is six. By the way, piping is not limited to using just two commands. You can combine many commands together. So let's go back to the previous example. We have used this command. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send the output of this. I mean, sorry, output of these commands. So this is the output actually. I'm going to send this output to head command. For example, let's say that I would like to see just the first two lines of this output. So I'm going to use head 2. Let's press enter. And now we only see the first two lines, which is this one, right? Another example can be sorting countries file alphabetically. So let me clear the screen. We have this countries file. Right now they are listed just some random order, let's say. And now we can send the output of this cut command to the sort command, which performs alphabetical sorting. So I'm going to use the command itself again, and then we have to use pipe, and then we're going to use sort command, press enter. The file is sorted alphabetically, so it starts from the first letter A, then B, C, D, and then etc. Now you learned how to use piping, so I have a small question for you. How you can display only the fifth line of this file on the terminal by using head and tail commands. So basically your command should display the fifth line. So the line is here. It is USA. So line 1, line 2, line 3, line 4, and line 5. So it will display USA. Please pause the video here and just give it a try. Yes, you really found it. You are awesome. We're going to use piping. So let's clear the screen. So at first, we're going to display the only first five lines of the file. So we're going to use head 5 and then countries.txt. So this will display the first five lines. And then we're going to send the output of this command to tail command. We're going to use piping and then let's use tail. So as you already guessed that, tail command where we will only display the last line. So in order to display the last line, we have to use minus one. And now we can press enter. And the command is correct. It just displays USA, which is the fifth line. Or you can also use the other way, like displaying the last five lines and then extract the first line from the output. So we're gonna use tail five. But before that, I'm gonna show you this file again. Sorry, it should be 
country s okay now we're gonna say tail five and then we have to pipe this output to head command so it should be head one sorry we didn't provide the file name so it will be countries.txt oh i'm really sorry we should display the last six lines because if we do it this way let's do countries.txt so if we have to show the first line from here first line is usa and tail five it will display line one line two line three line four and line five so here it should be six so it will start from usa we're gonna use this again and we are just gonna write six and from the six the output of this command so it will be like that the output will be start from usa to finland and then we're gonna extract the first line using head so it will be usa let's press enter so that's correct that works piping is one of the useful features in linux so it will save you a lot of time but for now that's it about piping i hope you like this tutorial while you are working with text files you will often need to search for a specific word or text in linux grep command will help you to do that grep stands for general regular expression so do not worry i will explain what are the regular expressions but for now let's just use grep command itself so let's use lsl to see what we have here so we have this file country usa info.txt i'm gonna display this file so this is just a file that contains some information about usa now we need to search for usa the string usa within this file so in order to do that we're gonna use grep command just write grep and then after that you have to provide what text or what string you have to search for so it will be usa in this case then we are going to provide the file name that we want to search so press enter actually it didn't find the word we are looking for the word is usa and it didn't find this word so it is because the usa is written with uppercase letters there is one option for grep command to ignore case sensitivity the option is i so i'm going to use grep then our option will be i then again usa and then we have to provide file name now press enter okay it finds usa but the problem is it also displays some other text that just contains three letters usa but actually they are different words we only need to display the word USA itself with big letters. To do so, you can use another option, which is W, which tells the grep command to search for the word USA. So I'm going to use this command again, but now we have to provide this W option. If we press enter, they're going to see that it only displays the word USA with big letters. Let's see another example. So under ATC, I'm going to use cat command under etc we have this ssl directory and under ssl we have this open ssl.config so press enter we see that it's a long file and the lines that start with this hash sign are comments so let's say i want to display only lines that start with hash sign so i'm going to use grep command again let's clear the screen so we are going to use grep and then we have to provide the hash sign which is the sign that we are looking for so then we have to provide the file so it will be open ssl.cnv or config let's press enter it doesn't display anything it is because of the shell interpretation in simple terms the shell recognizes this sign differently in order to escape shell interpretation it is better to put this sign between quotes so i'm gonna use the same thing again but now we have to just put some quotes here great now it works but i said i want to see only lines that start with hash sign but right now it displays all lines which contain hash 
This is where we should use regular expressions. So the regular expression, also known as regex, is a method for searching for specific text in more powerful and adaptable manner. To do so, we need to use this hat sign. Let's just clear the screen. So I'm going to use the command again. But we have to use this hat sign, or it's also called caret, C-A-R-E-T. So this small sign will display the lines that start with this pattern, which means that the pattern is actually a hash sign. So basically this sign, hat sign or caret sign, is just the beginning of the line, let's say. And if we press enter, as you see that it only displays lines start with the hash sign. So that's correct and that works. Let's also pipe this output to another grip. For example, let's search for the lines that ends with some string, for example, I O N. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this command again. Then we have to pipe this output to grip. And then now we have to indicate the line ending. So it will be ion, I O N. This is the string that we are looking for. And in order to indicate the line ending, we have to use this dollar sign. Press enter. Now the output of this command is piped to this command, which looks for the word or lines. I'm sorry, actually it's lines. So it looks for the lines that ends with this string. Let's do one more piping. From this output, I want to search for a specific string, such as there is a letter A. And after A, there can be D or N. So it will be AD or AN. So we're gonna use this command again. Then we're gonna pipe this output. I mean this output. We're gonna pipe it to another grip. So it will be grip. And then we have to put quotes. And then we are looking for some strings that start with A. And after A, there can be D or N. So these brackets just shows the it will be D or N. So this is just simple OR sign, let's say. It will give us all the strings which contain A N or A D. So let's press enter. It seems that our command works and we are good here. As you see that grep is really a powerful command, especially if you work with text files. Therefore, I suggest you read some articles about it and learn a few other regular expressions that can be useful. In this tutorial, we are going to learn how redirection works in Unix. Actually, you already know how it works because we have used piping, which is the most common redirection method. It takes one command output and redirects it to another command input. In Linux, we have three types of redirection. They are standard input, standard output, and standard error. Computer keyboard is used as standard input. Computer screen or monitor is used as standard output and standard error. All three methods have file descriptor number. So it is zero for standard input, one for standard output, and two for standard error. So far, if it is still unclear for you, don't worry because you will understand better when you start doing practice. Why we are waiting actually, let's jump into practice. If we execute a command called ls al we're gonna get a list of files in the terminal. This is standard output, but sometimes you will want to redirect this output to a file. So let me clear the screen and I'm gonna create a file. Let's use touch command. And the file name, for example, will be output redirection. And we're going to redirect the output to this file. So we're going to use ls-l -l command again. And we're going to redirect this output. So for redirection, output redirection, we need to use this more than sign. So let's redirect it to our new file called output redirection. Press enter. We didn't get anything on the terminal because all the output is written to this file. So let's read it. Okay, the output is here. Now let's run echo hello world. 
so which actually just prints the string hello world in our terminal we are going to redirect this command output to output redirection file as well so we are going to use the same command again and we are going to redirect it to the output file which is output redirection press enter so it is there let's just read it great the output is written to the file but it is overwritten if you don't want this overwritten happening you can use two more than operator which will append the output to the file let's just use this command again so first of all this file contains hello world and we're gonna do ls hyphen al and then for that we're gonna use two more than operators for just preventing overwriting so let's redirect it to output redirection file presenter and if we read this file again as you see that hello world string is here and also we have appended these lines to the file now let's use standard error so let me show you some error examples i'm going to execute the command grab and we're going to search for the string hello under etc directory and under the etc we have to search for everything and by the way i use this r option r means recursive so it will search all the files under etc so press enter okay it looks for the string hello in the files that are located under etc directory the point is under etc there are some files that this user i mean hken udemy one user doesn't have any permission to read them that's why the command gives permission denied error and by default error messages so permission denied is an error message so these error messages are displayed on the screen but we can redirect these errors to a file so let's clear the screen and we're going to use the same command but this time we are going to output this error for the error you have to use file descriptor number two and then more than sign and then your file let's call it error file for example and by the way if this error file doesn't exist then it will be created automatically and let's press enter as usual we just received standard output in the terminal because we didn't redirect this output to any file but we didn't see any error messages because we just redirected error messages to this error file and let's read this file so errors are here what i usually do is to send these error messages to the directory called dev now so let me show you this is the directory dev now this file is a special file and it exists in every linux system any data written to this file will disappear it's like a black hole whatever you write into it it will disappear i usually send error messages to this file of course if they are not important because sometimes you may want to analyze those errors so let's just use it we're gonna use this command again and this time we are gonna send the error messages to this directory or this file null file press enter so we get the standard output here but we didn't get an error because they are sent to this dev null file all right that's it about standard error now it is time to see how standard input works so i'm going to clear the screen and if we do ls hyphen l so you see that we have this countries.txt file so we can pipe the output of cat command i'm going to use cat and then let's read this file countries.txt and we're going to pipe the output to let's say the word count command so we're gonna just count the lines in this file it displays the total number of lines for this file there is also another way to do this using standard input so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna write the command first word count hyphen l and then we are gonna send i mean not send but we are gonna provide the input file to this command so for that we have to use standard input for the standard input we have to use this less than sign which is the opposite of standard output where it was more than operator 
So we're going to use list and operator. And then we have to provide our input file, which will be concrete.txt. It displays total number of lines. What we are doing here is to provide countries.txt file as an input to word count command. This is called standard input. You can even redirect this output to another file as well. So let's use the same command one more time. And we're going to send the output to another file. So output is 10. We're going to send this output to, let's say, line dash file. Press enter. And if we read this file, so the output is there. Using standard input will be especially useful if you are trying to create some scripts to automate your daily tasks. Anyway, this is all about redirections. I will see you in the next video. In Linux, we can define a user as a system which is granted access to the computer or system security. Users can be added or removed from the system and their access can be managed through the use of permissions and groups. There are two types of users in Linux, system users and regular users. We can look at the list of current users, including system and regular users, in the pastwd file, which is located under etc. So I'm going to use cat command, and then you're going to look at the users. So it should be pastwd. The system users are used to run the system processes, while regular users are used to for daily tasks such as logging and running programs. For example, here you can see the list of users, and the first column contains the name of users. We have operator users, we have TSAs, we have crony, so they're system users, and we have also a regular user, for example, a goes like the one is a regular user. And in this virtual machine, you can create many regular users and give some permission to use your system. When you read some articles about users in Linux, you're going to see that they are dividing users into two groups, the privileged users and unprivileged users. The default privileged user is a root user. So now let's jump to the next video to learn more about root user. The root user, also known as super user or administrator, is the highest level of the user on Linux. This user has complete access to all files and system resources and also can perform any action on the system, including installing and removing software, creating and deleting users, and modifying system settings. When you log into the virtual machine that you created on Google Cloud, you will be automatically logged in as a user that matches with your email username. I just activated another free account that's why here you see the different user. So previously it was hkenudem1, which was also my email username. And now I use my another email called aegulzaid1. That's why I logged in as this user. And I would like to mention that this user has sudo access that allows regular users to temporarily elevate their privileges and perform tasks that would normally require the root user's permissions. For example, to change the password of root user, you need to become a root user. However, since this user has sudo access, it means that we can change the root password. And in order to do that, we're going to use sudo, and then we have to provide the command that is used to change the password. So press enter. It says changing password for user root, so I'm going to provide a new password. Okay, my password is just created. In order to switch to root user, we're going to use the command, and if we press enter, we're going to be prompt to enter root password. I'm going to just write my password. So we switch to root user. So this two command opens a new subshell where you can work as the target user. In this case, it's a root user. The problem with this method is that some variables may not be set correctly. Therefore, we're going to use hyphen. So I'm going to use su and then hyphen. Hyphen allows complete access to the target user's account. First of all, let's go back to our regular user. So I'm going to use exit command. So let's clear the screen and we're going to use su dash sign and then provide your password. If you also notice in previous videos, whenever I switch to a different user, I've always used hyphen with su command. 
it's a kind of habit that I managed to have through some time. So I recommend you to use hyphen whenever you are switching the user. There's another thing that I would like to mention is that you need to keep in mind that in many Linux distributions, the default root account is locked to prevent bad actions from logging in as a root. It's not recommended to become a root user, but instead to get temporary root permissions, sudo, which I talked about earlier, is considered a more secure alternative. sudo stands for super user do, and we can give sudo access to any user that we want. We're gonna talk more about sudo later, but for now I think we learned the importance of the root user and its capabilities. Therefore, I'm gonna end this video here and see you in the next tutorial. We already know that the part before this add side displays the username, which is a root either one in this case. There is also another way to see which user you are currently using. So I'm gonna type who am I and it will display the current user. Or to get more information, you can also type ID. So here UID means that user ID, which is a thousand in this case. And GID means that group ID, which is thousand and one in this case. We're gonna learn groups in a separate tutorial, but here I just would like to mention that the users can be member of two different groups. There is primary group and the secondary group. Right now there is primary group whose name is the same as the username. So primary group is this one, a group either one. Then we have some secondary groups which have their own IDs as well. For example, ADM is a secondary group and ID is for or Google Sudoers, it's a secondary group as well, and the ID is 1000 in this case. Let's create our first user. So in order to do that, we're gonna use user at command. Then we have to type our username. I mean the username that you want to create. So it will be user at Tahir, and let's press enter. By the way, Tahir is my brother's name, and he's helping me to create these courses. However, as you notice that we get permission denied error, so in order to create users, you need to have some privileges. That's why let's switch to root user, or we may use sudo command in the beginning of the command. So I'm gonna use this command again, but to the beginning, we're gonna add sudo. This user, I mean, a either one user, has sudo access. That's why we are able to use sudo. I'm gonna press enter. The user is created. We can also set a password for the new user. So I'm gonna write pass wg, and then we have to provide our username. So it will be password data here, and let's press enter. Okay, it says only root can specify a username, or we may also use sudo in the beginning. So I'm gonna write the password. The password is set for this user. Let's clear the screen, and let's switch to Tahir user. So sudo Tahir, and we have to provide the password that we set. And let's run who am I. So we are Tahir user. Also we can write ID. So it displays user ID and primary group ID. User ID is 1002 and group ID is 1003. As you notice that Tahir user doesn't have any secondary group. Of course we can add secondary group but not in this video. But let me ask you a simple question. Where all this information is written to when the new user is created? Yes, you are absolutely right. They are all written to passwg file under etc. So I'm going to use vim and then we have to open this passwg file. If you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that Tahir user is here. The first column displays the username, which is for example Tahir. The second column displays the password, but for security reasons it is set to X. And the third column displays the user ID, and the first column displays the group ID. Fifth column displays the comments actually, but it is optional. For Tahir user there is no comment, that's why it is left empty. But for example, for the systemd OAM user, systemd OAM, we have comment, so it says systemd user space. OAM killer. And the sixth column, which is this one, or let's say that this one, it displays the user's directory, or let's call it home directory, when the user is placed after working. The last column, which is this one, defines the user's shell. When we connect to a virtual machine, or let's say server, 
the shell program is started. Tahir user has the shell access, but as you notice that for systemd users, there is mostly no login shell. For example, there is no login, and this one also has no login, so they are all system users. That's why they don't have login shell. I'm gonna exit this one. We have also another file called shadow under etc. So I'm gonna use less etc and then let's grip shadow. So this is the file that we are looking for. This file stores password properties. So I'm gonna clear the screen and let me use vim and etc. Then we have to use shadow. It is empty because we don't have permission to open this file. In order to open it, either you have to be a root user or you need to have sudo access. So let's exit that and we're gonna use sudo in the beginning. Okay, it says Tahir is not in sudo file. So it means that Tahir user doesn't have any sudo access. Later I will show you how to give sudo access to Tahir user. But for now let's switch to default user who has sudo access so i'm gonna exit this user so we're gonna be able to the one user which has sudo access and if we use here sudo then let's use vim etc shadow file so this is the file we are looking for and tahir user is also here the first column displays the username and all other columns are related to password properties for example the second column, which is this one, or this one, this column displays encrypted password. I will not talk more about this file, but I will provide an article that explains each column in a detailed way. So if it is interesting for you, then you can have a look. So I'm gonna end this video here, and I will see you in the next video. When you look at the man page of this user at command, you're gonna see that there are a lot of options that can be used. You can explore these options yourself, but I'm gonna show you what default options are used when you use the user add command. So let's exit. I'm gonna clear the screen. So we have two files. One is located under etc default. So I'm gonna use ls-l etc default and then user add. So this is the first file. And then we have also another file. It is located under etc as well. So lsl etc, the file called login.devs. But first of all, let's look at this etc default user add. All these parameters are really important, but we have two most important parameters here. So they are shell and scale parameter, or let's say variable. As a default, the user shell will be bash, so it is bin bash pass. And we have this interesting variable called scale. So it defines skeleton pass. So while you are creating users, home directories will be created by default. And if you add anything to the skeleton directory, I mean to this directory, it will be copied to the user's home directory when you create a new user. Let me show you this directory. I'm going to use ls-l etc scale. Currently, we don't have anything under this directory. I'm gonna add some files to this directory. So I'm gonna, first of all, let's switch to this directory. So cd, then etc, scale. And we can use and sign here. Then we have to create some files. Let's use touch file. And we have to create, let's say, five files. Press enter. And if we do ls-l, all files are created. Now I'm gonna create a new user. So I'm gonna use sudo user add, sorry, user add. And then let's say that our username will be new user. Press enter. The user created. So let's set a password for this user. So passwd new user. And let's set the password. Now let's switch to this user, sudo dash, the username is new user, and write the password, and if we do pvd, so we are in the home directory of this user, and if we do ls-l, 
sorry, ls-l, and you will see that the files that we created under etc skill directory are copied to this home directory of this user. So that's how it works. By the way, you can also set user at defaults in a way that when new user is created, home directory will not be created. Actually, they are all defined in the login devs file. So I'm going to use vim etc login devs. You can do a lot of stuff here. So let me show you this create home. As you see that it says create home variable is set to yes. So it means that when the new user is created, there will be also home directory is created. And we have also another variables. So we have three variables called pass max days, mean days and worn edge. So actually they are all explained here in these comments. So max days is a maximum number of days a password may be used. And minimum days, of course, it's the days allowed between password changes. So right now it is zero, which means that you can directly change the password of this user, the new user. And we have also warning. So it means that number of days warning given before a password expires. Let's say the password will expire after 10 days. And if you set this warning to seven, you will get a warning before seven days a password expires. You can also look at the password properties using one command. I'm gonna exit here. Let's quit that. Let me clear the screen. You have this command called change password expired information. So the name is chh. So it changed the user password expired information. Let's quit that. We can look at the user's password information using this command. And you have to provide this L option, then your username. So it will be new user. In current station, the account will never expire for this user, but actually we can change it. So I'm going to use this command change and we're going to provide this E option. And then let's say that the account will expire in this date, for example, 2024. And let's say that December 31 and provide your username so in this case it is new user press enter permission denied of course uh, we don't have permission to do this command so let's exit here and let's copy this command paste it here and use sudo of course press enter so it is already changed i'm gonna use change l and our username new user press enter sorry you have to switch to new user and let's run that command one more time okay as you see that the account expires on december 31 2024 you can also set these parameters using some option with past ability command when you create a password for a user but for now, let's see how we're going to delete a user. So let me clear the screen. If you type user delete, and then you have to provide your username, it will delete just the user. But if you want to delete user's home environment and everything under this environment as well, you will need to use this option called R. So this is the option that we're going to use. But let me do control C and let's look at this user del and let's look at the, our option. So it says remove files in the user's home directory will be removed along with the home directory itself. Let's commit that. But in order to run this command, either you have to have sudo access or you need to switch to root user. So let's exit from this user. So the one has sudo access, so I'm going to use sudo, then user delete, provide the option R, and the username, press enter. Okay, it seems it is deleted, but how can we be sure that this user is deleted? Well, of course, we can check the password file under etc. So let's use cat etc, and let's look at this password file, and you will see that the new user is not here. The last user is Tahir. 
but the new user is deleted. But what about the home directories? Let's check if the directory is deleted or not. So let's create a screen. So lsl, so all the home directories of all users is stored under this home directory. Let's press enter. So I don't see any directory called new user. So it means that it is deleted. So that's it about this video. I'm going to explain user environments in the next video. In the last video, we created some files in the etc scale directory. But before creating the file, I executed ls command there and told you that there are no files in this directory. However, if I executed ls a to list all files, you will see that there were already three hidden files bash logout, bash profile, and bash rc. When a new user is created, these files are copied to the user's home directory. But what are these files? Well, I believe that you remember the tutorial where I explained internal and external commands. In that tutorial, we have used pass variable. Let me print this variable. So I'm going to use echo, then dollar sign, and then provide the variable name so it is pass. The pass variable can be different for every user because this is environment variable. So I'm going to type env to list all environment variables. You'll see that we have a lot of environment variables. In order to set the user environment, we have four files that can be used. Let me create the screen. And these files are etc profile. So I'm going to use etc profile. And then we have etc hrc. And then we have the user specific files. So the first one is bash profile. And the last one is bashrc. ETC profile and ETC bashrc are used for default settings for all users. But that profile, I mean that bash profile and that bashrc is used for specific settings for one user. It means that when you log in, the system will read first ETC profile, then ETC bashrc, then it will read user specific files, which is first bash profile and then bashrc. To explain it clearly, I'm going to create a variable called my file and set a different value in each file. So let me clear the screen. First of all, I'm going to edit etc profile. So let's use sudo vim etc profile. Press enter. You can press shift and g to go to the end of the line. So I'm going to use shift and g. And here let's insert export and then our variable name will be my file and the value will be let's say that etc profile will be used and exit and save and also we have to do the same thing for bashrc So shift G to go to the end of line and I'm going to use E and then let's add here. So export my file and the value will be this time etc bashrc will be used and save and exit. Let's see that they are really there. So I'm going to use grip and grip my file under etc profile and also under etc bashrc. So we set our variable and its value. However, we still don't know what's the difference between etc profile and etc bashrc. So keep in mind that etc bashrc will be read when you start a subshell. etc profile will be read when we start a login shell. So let's type bash to just reload the shell and see which file is being read. So I'm going to use echo then dollar sign and then let's print our variable okay it says etc bashrc will be used so as you notice that bashrc is being read so if you set the same variable with different values in both etc profile and etc bashrc file you need to consider that bashrc will have the superiority over the etc profile 
Now I'm gonna set the same variable in the user's bash profile and bash rc file. So let's clear the screen. So we're gonna use bash profile. And let's add here, for example, export my file. And let's say that value will be this file, I mean bash profile will be used and save and then let's do the same thing for hrc file let's add here to the end of line so i'm gonna write export my file and hrc will be used and save. Let's type bash to reload the shell. And let's do echo dollar sign my file. This time user specific bash rc is used because the user's both bash profile and bash rc files will overwrite etc profile and etc bash rc files. So you can add many variables in your bash profile or bash rc files in the same way. Well, I think that's all about user environments. I hope you liked this tutorial. Now it is time to learn how to work with groups. So let's jump to the next video. As we said earlier, in Linux there are two types of groups. Primary groups and secondary groups. Each user must have a primary group, but a secondary group is optional. We're gonna talk more about users, primary groups and secondary groups in the next section, where I will explain file permission management. But for now, let me show you where you can find information about groups. So similar to etc pastwd file, we have the same kind of file for groups. I'm gonna use bin, and then under etc, we have this group file. It contains four fields. The first field displays the group name. The second field displays the password, but as you guessed that, of course it is set to X for security reasons. The third column, displays the group ID and the last column shows the users who are the member of this group as a secondary group. Please pay attention to what I said. The last column doesn't show users who are member of this group as their primary group, but it shows the users who are member of this group as their secondary groups. For example, we have group called video, I think. Yes, it is here. We have a group called video and a glues id1 and a glues id are the members of this group as their secondary group. Actually, we can confirm that by using command id. So let's just exit this file. And let's type id. As you see that a glues id1 is the member of this group called video. But of course, this video group is the secondary group for this user. We also have another file similar to shadow file for users. For groups, it's called gshadow. So I'm going to use sudo vim. Then under etc, we have this gshadow file. This file is more about password properties, but nowadays it's not commonly used. So let's just exit here. And I would like to show you how to add groups. For that, we're going to use group add command. Let's imagine that we have two teams called developers and testers. And in each team, we have two employees. Or in other words, imagine that we have two groups called developers and testers. And for each team, we have two members. So let's create groups. But before that, let me switch to root user to not use sudo every time. So I'm going to write the password of root user. And then let's create a screen. So I'm going to add group add command. So actually this command is used to add the groups. So first group will be testers. And the second group will be developers. And let's create two tester users and two developer users. So I'm going to use user add. Then let's say tester1, tester2. And let's create developer users, so developer1 and developer2. 
now we can check that which users are member of tester and developer groups so for that we can use this group names command then you have to provide g option and then write the group name so it is testers and then dash l to list the users so right now no users are added to this group let's see what's the group of these users i mean these new users so for example we can check the tester one or let's say developer one sorry developer oh, i think i just made a typo here anyway let's do the same so dev l e o pair okay we see that each user has their own primary group so for the tester it is called tester group tester one group i mean for the developer one it's called developer one group now i would like to add tester users to tester groups as their secondary group and developer users to developers group as their secondary groups so let's clear the screen in order to do that we're going to use user math command and then we need to provide a option and then uppercase g and you have to provide your group name so it is testers and then the user that you want to add to this group so press enter and if we do id tester1 you will see that this tester1 user is added to testers group as it is secondary group actually it's really important to use these a and g options otherwise if tester1 user was a member of other groups as it is secondary groups without a and g options user mode command will remove tester1 user from all other secondary groups and just add testers group as a secondary group that's why you need to use a and g options when adding user to the secondary group okay let's add other users as well so let's use user mode command and let's add tester2 and for the developers it will be developer group let's check it for example id developer1 okay it's added to the developers group as it is secondary group actually we can use group memes command to see the list of users so it will be group memes and then provide the key option then the group name for example let's use developer and then dash l to list all users okay it doesn't exit because it is is s so we have developer one and developer two and let me clear the screen and let's see for the testers so for this group we have tester1 user and tester2 user i think you learned how to add groups and you also learned that how to add users to the new created groups so now i'm gonna delete these users if you remember from the previous tutorials we have used user deal command so user delete then provide dash r and then the username so tester1 tester2 then it will be developer1 and developer2 and we can also delete the groups so it will be group delete and then just the group name and then it will be developers so let's now check that if these groups are deleted so i'm going to use group names developers so it doesn't exist so it is deleted and let's also use testers testers group is also deleted i think that's all about groups and let's jump to the next tutorial i assume that you really wonder why a glues either one user had a sudo access but a user called tahir which we created in the user management tutorials didn't have sudo access and if you remember that I told you I will show you how to give sudo access to Tahir user. Now it's time to do that. So I'm going to switch to Tahir user. 
if we execute this command so sudo vim and then etc shadow provide the password for tahir it complains that tahir is not in the sudoers file but what is this file and why tahir user is not in there so i'm gonna switch to root user so dash actually sudoers file is located under etc so we can look at it under etc we have sudoers file and if we scroll down or up a little bit down okay here it is please pay attention to this line it says that it will allow root to run any commands anywhere that's why root is really powerful user there is also similar line but it's applied to with groups so if you look at here it's kind of similar to this line but this line is for the view group that's why it has this percentage sign here it means that any user who is a member of this view group as it is secondary group is able to run all commands so i assume that a glue one user which was created by default when we created a virtual machine is a probably a member of this view group so actually let's check it let's exit this file I'm gonna type id and then provide the username okay this user is not member of wheel group but i see something related to sudoers so it's called google sudoers so it seems that this user is a member of this group and let's see if this group has permission to run all commands so i'm gonna use vim then etc sudoers and let's just search these Google Sudoers. Actually, there's easy way. You can just type forward slash and then just type Google. If there's anything related to Google, it will display. Okay, we don't see anything related to Google Sudoers. But if you notice that at the end of the line, it emphasized that all files under etc sudoers.d directory will be included in the Sudoers file. So let's see what we have under this directory. I'm going to exit and let's use ls-l and etc sudoers.d. All right, we have a file called Google sudoers. I think that explains everything. Let's read this file. I'm going to use cat etc sudoers.d and then this file. Okay, this line is very similar to the lines that we have seen in this Sudoers file. So actually, it means that all users who are member of Google Sudoers group as their secondary group can run all commands without being prompt for a password. A goes either one is a member of this group. That's why that user is able to run commands that require root privileges. But how are we going to add Tahir user to Sudoers file? It is very simple actually. Either we can add user Tahir to this Google Sudoers group or to the wheel group. So I'm gonna add this Tahir user to the wheel group actually. Let me clear the screen. So let's use user mod. And then as you already know that we can use A and G option, provide the group name, and then just write your user that you want to add to this wheel group press enter and if we do id tahir okay we see that tahir user is the member of this wheel group as it is secondary group and if we switch to tahir user and if you run sudo vim etc shadow provide the password so that's great now we are able to open this file but before that we couldn't open this file so it means that the user Tahir has sudo access now. You can add many users to sudoers file, but for now I think that's all about sudo access. And I hope you like this tutorial. Bye, I will see you in the next video. In this video, we're gonna try to understand what ownership is. As it seems from its name, the file ownership tells who owns the file. Let's do a long listing here. I'm gonna use LSL. So this command gives very useful information about the file. These two fields, the first column, 
and these two fields as well, they are really important and they are really interesting for us. They display the file ownership. There are two types of ownership, user ownership and group ownership. Just keep in mind that the first one always tells who owns the file as a user and the second one tells who owns the file as a group. So we have file, it's called file one and the user ownership of this file is a equals either one and group ownership is a equals either one as well. We have also this first column which displays the file permissions. I'm going to explain it in a detailed way in this section but for now it is worth knowing that we have three permission types read which is this one then we have write and then we have execute and this column is able to contain 10 character spaces so the first character tells the file type for example right now this one shows d which is a it means that it's a directory so it's a folder and the, for example l displays it's a link file type is a link and if there is nothing it means that it's just a regular file for example file one is just a regular file and after the first character we have just nine characters the first three shows the user permissions this shows the group permissions and these ones the last three shows the other permissions i'm going to explain what other is in a minute but let's see what happens when you are trying to access a file well it's actually very simple the shell is checking the ownership for example if you are trying to access let's say that file one or to any file the shell will always check the user ownership of the file if you are the user owner of the file then you get the permissions that are set for the user and in this case it is the first three permissions for the user and the shell will not check further if you are not user owner of the file then the shell will check the group ownership of the file if you are group owner then you get the permissions that are set for group for example let's look at the file 2 for this file the user ownership is a goes either one but the group ownership is tahir so that means that anyone who is the member of group tahir will get group permissions of this file as you remember group permissions is the second three character let's say that you are neither user owner or the group owner of the file in this case you will get the permissions that are set for others and those permissions are the last three permissions we often need to play with the file ownership for that we can use change ownership command let me clear the screen so it is written as this and let's say that we are gonna change the ownership of the first file for example this is file one and the user and group ownership is a goes either one i'm gonna change this ownership to a goes either user a dot goes either user and then you have to provide the username and then you just provide the file name press enter sorry you have to use sudo and if you do lsl so the file one the user ownership of the file one is a dot goes either or maybe let's change the user ownership of this folder to tahir so right now it is a goes either one i'm going to use change ownership then provide the username which will be tahir and then the file okay i just forgot again so it should be sudo and let's do lsl okay now the user owner is tahir but the point is under this folder we have two image files two png files let's say and for these files the user ownership and group ownership is a glues either one but actually we change the ownership of this folder to tahir user but the ownership of the files under this folder didn't change so that's why it is better use our option with this command so if you provide this uppercase r it means that it will change the ownership recursively i mean the everything under the folder will be changed to whatever user you are trying to provide so in this case it will be tahir and then let's provide the file name so folder press enter but before that let's use sudo okay if i do lsl 
the user ownership of the folder is Tahir that's correct and if we do LSL folder okay now the user owner is Tahir for these files as well so it's better to use this uppercase R option with change ownership command I'm going to do LSL again you can also change the group ownership of the file using change ownership command for example let's say that I would like to change these folders user ownership and group ownership as well so I'm going to use change ownership and then you have to provide the user let's say that it will be a that goes out there and then provide the group name let's say that group will be Tahir and let's provide the file so it will be folder let's use sudo as well okay let's press enter so as you see that for this folder the ownership the user ownership change from Tahir to a.gulzade and the group ownership change to Tahir from a.gulzade1 maybe you want to change just the group ownership not the user ownership in that case you can use change ownership command and then you don't need to provide the user you just type colon and after that you can type colon and maybe dot as well it's possible you have two ways so colon or dot and for example I'm gonna change this file one the group owner of this file one to a glue one so I'm gonna use a glue one and provide the file name so file one press enter okay sorry sudo and if we do lsl the group owner of the file one was Tahir and now we change it to a glue one there's also another command to do that it's called change group so I'm gonna use change group command this is also used to change the group ownership of the file so I would like to change the group ownership of file 2 to let's say a that goes out there so I'm gonna use change group then provide the group name a goes out there and then file name and of course we need to use sudo press enter lsl okay file 2 is a.glusider group owner is a.glusider there is also another important thing that I would like to mention is that the user who creates the file automatically becomes the user owner and the primary group of that user becomes the group owner for example I'm gonna create a file called file 4 press enter and if you do lsl as you see that for the file for the user owner and the group owner is a cruzade one because right now I'm using a cruzade one user that's why it's automatically taking that user as a user owner and the primary group of that user as a group ownership so maybe let's switch to Tahir user I think I provided the wrong password okay now it's correct so for example let's do lsl we have five files i'm gonna create one more file let's see for maybe let's create folder and press enter so if you do lsl the user ownership and the group ownership of this folder is tahir because we are using the tahir user you can also create some link uh, let me just list the files so let's say that we're gonna create sim link to file 5 so I'm gonna use file 5 and then I'm gonna give the name sim link name to file 5 press enter lsl so we created that sim link and the user owner and the group owner is Tahir so I think that's all about file ownership I'm gonna see you in the next tutorial last time we shortly talk about user permissions now i'm gonna explain what they really do let's get started we have three basic permissions so we have read then we have write and finally we have execute permission so in linux they will be represented as r for read and then w for write and x for execute permission they have also a numeric representation we have four for read permission and then we have two 
for write permission and then you'll have one for execute permission. For example, let's look at some permissions in our Linux machine. I'm going to switch the top and let's do lsl long listing here. So we have some permissions here. I'm going to copy these three of them for the file, for the directory and for the link. And I'm going to paste it here. Okay, this is better. So as you already know that the first permissions are for the user. So these first three are for the user and the second three are for the group and the last three are for the other permissions. I mean for the others. So let's look at here. For the user, I'm going to change the color. Let's take yellow. For the user, we have read and write. So it will be for read four and then write two. And here we have only R. So only read permission. So it will be four. And here we have only read. So it will be four as well. So if we try to represent these all permissions as a number, then it will be 644. So the result will be 644 for these permissions. So it means that, so it means that we have file for write. The permissions of this file is 644 as a numeric representation. And then here we also have, let me change the color. So this time let's take red one. So there is for the directory, as you already know that. So we have again three and three. So right now we have a read, write and execute. So it is four, two and one. And then we have four and one. And for others, we have four, one. So it means that the numeric representation of these permissions will be four, two, one. It will be seven and then five and then five. So it is seven, five, five. And for this, basically all the permissions are applied to this uh, file. So it will be four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two, one. So the total will be seven, seven, and seven. Three, seven means that all the permissions are applied to our file or directory or whatever we have. But what really do these permissions mean? I will explain what happens if these permissions are applied to a file and folder. So let me create a simple table. We have three permissions, read, write, and execute. So if read permission is applied to a file, then you can only open that file and read it. It means that, so let me just write it. You can open the file. So what does it mean? It means that we can use some Linux command. For example, we can use cut, we can use tail, we can use add command or we can use vim command to open the file. And if this command is applied, I mean, if this read permission is applied to a directory, then it means that the read permission allows you to list the contents of that directory. So it will list content of directory. It lists the content of directory. And what does it mean? It means that we can run which command as you already guessed, we can run ls command here. Let's look at the write permission. So if write permission is applied to a file, then you can write to that file. Or in other words, you can make some changes on that file. So let's just write changes to let's say content of the file. Basically it will write to a file. However, you need to keep in mind that it doesn't allow you to delete or create new files. To do that, you will need to write permission on the directory itself. 
where you want to create or delete the file. So what does it mean? It means that if the right permission is applied to a directory, it will create and delete the files. So what does it mean? It means that basically we can run rm command here. rm means remove or you can also run rm directory as well. We have also execute permission. I'm gonna change the color. So this permission is really interesting and it is needed to execute a file. So what does it mean? It means that if this permission is applied to a file, we can run a program file. So let me just write it. We can run a program file. However, if it is applied to a directory, then you are allowed to change the directory. So what does it mean? Let me just write it. We can change to the, sorry, to the directory. I know that my handwriting is not good. So basically, we are allowed to use cd command to go to the that directory. So it means that, let me change the color. We can run cd command here. This is a really important permission for directories because without this permission, we can't change to that directory. All right, I think we learned everything about basic permissions. The next step is to apply what we have learned. That's what we will do in the next couple of videos. All right, let's get some hands-on experience. I'm going to talk about how permissions are related to each other. We already learned that we have a user owner, we have a group owner, and we have others who do not own the file. Then we have permissions of the file that are set based on the owners. So let's look at a few examples. I'm going to search the tab. Here we have multiple files. Let's take a look at the file one. The user owner of the file is a.gulzade who has read and write permissions. The group owner is a.gulzade1 who has the own read permission and other has also own read permission. I'm gonna read this file but before that let me check who am I. So I am a.gulzade1 user. Maybe we can check the group as well. Just type ID. So the primary group of this user is a glue one as well. Basically, this user, a glue one user, can read this file because the group owner have only read permission. So let's just read the file. We can type cat file one. Okay, it seems this file is empty. But how we can make sure that this command was successful? So the best way to know if the command that run was successful or not is to run echo, then dollar, and then question mark. So it returns zero. If it returns zero, then previous command was successful. It means that this command was successful. Now let's try to write something to this file. Let's just clear the screen. And I'm going to use echo. And then let's say hi. And I'm going to send this statement, hi, to the file 1. Let's press enter. Oops, it says permission denied. Why? Because for us, the group permission is set. So a group permission doesn't have any right permission. We can also use vim command. If you write vim file 1, you will see that it says this is read only file. But we can make changes to the file 1 copy. We can make changes to this file. Why? Because group permissions, right now we have write permission as a group owner. So since we are the group owner of this file, we can make any changes to that file. So I'm going to use this command again. And this time it will be file one, sorry, file one copy. We can check the command was successful or not. It was successful. We can also make changes on file 2 because we are the user owner of the file 2. And when we make any changes, the user permissions will be applied because a glue 1 user is the owner of the file. So I'm going to use the command, this command, 
and then we are gonna echo to file to let's press enter if we do echo dollar question mark so it's there we can also use cat file to so as you see that we have high statement here let's clear the screen it's still long listing and what about file 3 can we make any changes to that file well i think of course no but do you know why because both user and the group ownership of this file is root so in this case if we try to access to file 3 the other permissions will be applied because a goes either one is neither user or the group owner of the file the other as you can see here the other has only read permission cat file 3 and it's to echo dollar question mark so the command was successful so we can successfully read the file and if we do echo hi to file 3 we can't do that because we don't have write permission let's also check file 5 this is also interesting the user owner and the group owner of the file is Tahir basically it means that again we are not the user owner or the group owner of the file so it means that we I mean uh, a equals either one user belong to other so let's read the content of this file I'm gonna use cat file 3 sorry not 3 but we have to read the file 5 all right we got error which says permission is denied it is because other do not have any permission as you can see here for all other users there is no permission set to this file that's why we can't read the file finally let's check the directory if you notice this directory has execute permission for all users and if you remember in the last video i mentioned that in order to change to the directory or to use cd command the directory must have execute permissions that's the reason when you create a directory execute permissions will be applied for all users as a default so let's use cd command let's clear the screen i'm gonna do cd folder press enter so if we do pwd we are on the folder directory so since we are not the user owner and the group owner of the folder directory then other permissions will be set for us and it has execute and read permission do you remember what happens when read permission is applied to a directory well i believe you do because if read permission is applied to a directory then we can list the content of the directory so if we do let's go to the folder if we do ls here it will list all the files that we have here we are able to use ls command because of this read permission but what about creating a file in this directory can we do that let's check i'm gonna use touch file so we are under folder directory and here i'm gonna use touch file I'm, I'm gonna try to create the file let's press enter oops permission is denied because other do not have a right permission as you can see here we don't have right permission that's why we cannot create any file under this directory another interesting file is this symlink or symbolic link so link to folder which points to folder directory to this directory the thing is we own this file if you look at here we are the user owner and the group owner of this file but we do not own the folder which is pointed by this symbol in this symlink as you can see that we have write permission so does it mean that we can create files under the folder directory so let's just check it i'm gonna use touch then let's write our symlink oh sorry we are in the wrong directory i'm gonna use cd so let's use touch link to a folder and under this folder i'm gonna create this file let's say file 99 let's press enter all right permission denied so it means that we can create a file because this write permission is only applied to the symlink itself it doesn't mean that it will be applied to the file which is pointed by the symlink so just keep in mind that 
symlink or symbolic link permissions are not relevant. All right, it seems we covered everything related to the ownership and we really got good hands-on experience. That's all about this video. I'm gonna stop here and I will see you in the next tutorial. Setting permissions for files and directories is an essential task in Linux. We're gonna use the change mod command to do that. So it is written like that. It is worth mentioning that in order to change the permissions, either you have to be the owner of the file or you have to be a root user. Or in, in other words, we can say that you have to be a super user. So let's try to change the permissions of some files. But before that, let me do long listing here. I'm going to try to change the permissions for this file, file 2. Let's say I would like to set execute permission for user, write permission for group and other. Let's use change mode, then provide the user. I mean, you, you need to just write you, it's for the user. Then you have to give it a plus sign. And after that, we're going to set the execute permission, so X. And then for the group, it will be X as well. And then for the others, it will be X. And then just write your file name. So this will keep the current permissions of the file and add additional permissions. Let's press enter. If we do lspell file2, we just set execute permission for everyone. What about you want to remove the permission? Well, it's so easy actually. You just need to use minus sign. So we are gonna use the same command, but this time we are just using the minus sign. As you already guessed, so it's just so easy. Press enter and let's do lsl. So we don't have execute permission for anyone. If you want to set right permission for let's say everyone, you don't need to specifically mention the user, group and other. You will just give a plus sign and after that give the permission that you want to set. So we are just gonna use change mode and then just write plus then x then just your file name and press enter. So this will set execute permission for everyone. Let's do lsl file 2. As you can see, it is set for everyone. This is one of the way to set permission. Another way is to set using numeric representation. If you remember, I have mentioned that we have numeric representation as well. For example, let's say I would like to set full permissions. Let's say for the file. Let's look at here. Okay, let's say for file 4. We're gonna set full permissions for this file. The number for full permissions is 777. So 4 is for read, 2 is for write, and 1 is for execute. So the total is 7. We're gonna use change mode, then just write number 777, and then file name. Since we have user, group, and other, Therefore, we need to use 37. The first seven is for user, the second seven is for the group, and the last one is for other. Let's do lsl file 4. Okay, now we set full permissions for everyone. Let's say we want to set read and write permissions for user and nothing for group and other. Then, as you already assume, we're gonna use the same command, and this time, it will be 600. So read and write for user and nothing for group and other. So let's press enter. If we do lsl, so permissions are there. By the way, if you notice that this command will overwrite current permissions. So it means that it works in absolute mode. If you want to set permissions relative to the current permissions, then you can use the first way, like we did with letters. There is also one more thing that I would like to show you. I'm going to clear the screen. I'm going to create some directories. Let's say it will be test. And under test, we have directory one. But we need to use p option for the multiple directories. Press enter. So let's do ls, sorry, ls test. So we have directory one under test directory. 
and I'm gonna also create some files under this uh, test directory so let's see tests and file one so we have one directory one file okay let's go to the test directory and I'm gonna remove SL. so right now directory one has the execute permission right so because it should be there so we can just cd to the directory one if this directory doesn't have execute permission then we're not gonna able to change the directory so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna take this permission execute permission from this directory i'm gonna just change mode and then for everyone take out this execute permission from directory one if you do nsl okay right and directory one doesn't have any permission i mean execute permission let's go back to one direction back so i will do the same thing for the test directory so minus x then test let's do lsl okay test directory doesn't have execute permission basically it means that we can't go to that directory we see that it says permission denied but we can list the contents of that directory now i would like to add execute permission for all the directories that we have under test directory so in order to do that we're gonna use recursive method so i'm gonna use change mode then for the recursive we have to use our option and after that we're gonna say plus x for test so let's press enter let's do lsl test okay great directory one has execute permission and let's do lsl here and test directory has also execute permission so this is fine but the bad thing is under test directory we have also some files but previously this file doesn't have execute permission but when we do recursively when we set execute permission recursively it will just set execute permission for the files as well but we don't want to do that because when you apply execute permission to files it will just make it executable which is not good sometimes you don't need to set execute permission for all the files that's why we have to do one trick here i will show you that trick first of all you need to take execute permission from directory one and from the file one as well let's go to the test directory and here change mod x for directory one and let's say file one let's go back and let's take x from the test folder as well now what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna apply i'm gonna set execute permission to all the directories that we have i mean under this test directory but it will not affect the files so how we're gonna do that we're gonna use change mode command and of course we need to use our option for the recursive method then we're gonna write test sorry plus x for the execute and then the folder the folder name which is test but this time instead of this lowercase letter we're gonna use uppercase letter uppercase x then let's press enter let's do lsl so test directory has executed permission that's fine let's go to the test and let's do lsl here okay great as you see that directory one now has execute permission but we don't have execute permission for the file one if we try to sum up this situation you need to keep in mind that the uppercase x ensures that the files will not get the execute permission unless the file has already set the execute permission for some of the entities that's why it's really good to use uppercase x if you want to change the permissions recursively all right i think that's all about this tutorial i'm gonna see you in the next tutorial in general a repository is a location where data or information is stored you can think of a repository as a central storage room 
where you store your stuff. In our case, a repository is a central location where software packages are stored and made available for installation. You may also be wondering what a software package is. Basically, it's a collection of files and programs that are bundled together for easy installation. For example, we have one nice software package named Tree. This utility helps us to view our files and folders in tree-like structure. I'm gonna show you what it looks like, but you need to keep in mind that as a default, you will not find this utility in your CentOS machine. You will need to install it, and I'm gonna show you how to install it in the next tutorial. But for now, I already installed it on one of my Linux machines. Let me switch the tab. So we have one Linux machine here, it's a CentOS as well. Let's do ls here. We have two directory, Ansible, Nginx and bin. I'm gonna show you Ansible, Nginx. Here long listing just displays current files and directories, and it doesn't show subdirectories. However, if we use tree command, it will display all the files and subdirectories that we have under Ansible Nginx directory. So I'm gonna use tree. Let me just clear the screen. I'm gonna use tree, then Ansible Nginx. So tree command or utility is a software package that I have already installed. And we're gonna install software packages from the repository, which can be local or remote repository. Let me show you what repository keeps. So I'm gonna switch the tab to the, our whiteboard or maybe blackboard. Now I'm gonna draw a nice graph or maybe it will be a nice graph for me. So let's see, here we have repository And this repository contains three main components. The first one will be software packages. We have already talked about the software packages. For example, three command or three utility is a software package. And then we have the second component. Let's switch the color. The second component will be metadata. Let me just write it. Metadata. Metadata is about the uh, software packages, and what I mean by saying the metadata, it just provides information about the software packages, such as package name, version number, dependencies, and other information. And lastly, we have GPG key. I'm gonna change the color. Let's choose this one. I'm just gonna draw some lines. Okay, we have three components, software packages, metadata, and GPG key. So this key is optional component that is used to verify the authenticity and integrity of the software packages in the repository. To manage software packages, we also need a package manager. So it's called package and manager. In CentOS, we have a default package manager so it is called you or in full form it's called yellow dog updater modified i know it's a funny name but if you can google it you will see that why it is named like that but anyway whenever you use the software package manager to install some software packages it will check the available repositories to find the software package and then it will install it into your linux system let me just write Linux machine. For example, here we have, let's say, CentOS. This is our CentOS machine. And we are gonna use Yom in this CentOS machine to install software packages. So when you write, let's say, Yom install tree, what it's gonna do it's gonna go to the repository. So if you write this, it will go to the repository. It will find the right software package. Then it will install it to your CentOS machine. CentOS also comes with the set of default repositories that are enabled by default during installation. 
Let's check what repositories there are in the next video. We can list available repositories by running yum repo list. Let's press enter. Right now we have five repositories. Three of them are default CentOS repos and last two repositories are the Google Cloud default repositories. Let's say we want to install tree package, but we are not sure that if the package name was exactly tree or not. But we are 100% sure that the name contains the string tree. In that case, we can search by typing room, search, and then the package name that you want to search. So it will be tree in this case. Let's press enter. It scanned all the repositories and found several packages that contain the string tree. But if you look at the first package, this package, you will see that it says file system tree viewer. So I guess this is the package that we are looking for. So let's install this package. Let me clear the screen, then the package name. Press enter. Sorry, we have to be root user. Or maybe let's just switch to root user. We can also use sudo, but I just switched to root user. So I'm going to run yum install tree. When we run this command, you check the available repositories and found out that this package is located in the base OS repository. If we type yes here, it will download, it will install this package. But I'd like to show you one more thing. We can also pass this yes argument in the beginning. Let me just stop this process. So if you write you install tree, and then if you provide this Y option, it will install the package without asking for any confirmation. Let's do that. So let's press enter. Okay, the package is installed and it is complete. So let's use this tree command. Maybe we can look at our home directory. So I'm going to use tree home a.glue.de1 Okay, let's press enter. Okay, it seems that our tree package, our tree command works. We have one interesting and fun software package called Cosay. It generates an image of the code with a message. I know it's not very useful, but it's really fun. So I will try to install that package. Let's assume that we don't know the exact package name. That's why we're going to use yum search first. I'm going to use yum search and then let's say Cosay. Press enter. Well, it's not good. It says that no match found. It means that this package is not stored in our available repositories. Fortunately, I know in which repository this package is stored. This package is located. So we have one repository called EPEL. The full form of this repository is extra packages for enterprise Linux. Basically, some additional software packages are located in this repository. Therefore, first we're going to add the EPL repo, then install the Cosa package. Adding this repository is so easy. You just need to run yum install EPL then release. And let's put a Y option here so it will not ask for any confirmation. Let's press enter. It is complete. Now let's see that if we have this repo. So I'm going to use yum repo list. Okay, as I see that it is here. Extra packages for enterprise Linux. It's good. Now let's install Cosa. So I'm going to use yum install Cosa. As you see that this package has a dependency. I mean, it has a lot of dependency. That's why yum will install all the dependencies first. And then after that, it will install the, this Cosa package. This is the reason actually why package manager is very useful for the user because it automatically finds the dependencies and installs all of them. And let's just press Y and enter. Now it asks for the GPGG that I talked about in the first tutorial. I'm just going to put Y here and then press enter. And also I would like to mention that I just forgot to show you one more thing. 
if you look at here, as you see that this package is found in this repository called Apple. Okay, the package is complete. I mean, we just install it. So let's just use it. I'm gonna use call say, let's say hello world. Okay, something is wrong here. It says couldn't find call file for the default call. But I think we have these files in the user share. User share call say, let's press enter. Okay, we have calls. And under that we have a lot of files. Let's see that if we have default call default.co sorry yes the file is here we have this file but why it says it doesn't find the file okay let's see man page maybe we just wrote something wrong it seems everything is correct actually I think I found the issue this is the part that we need to consider so it says we should have this environment variable and it seems like it needs to point to the the directory that we have these call files so let's just use it let me just copy it let's clear the screen so i'm gonna say call what was it call pass and then let's put the directory user share call say and call let's press enter now i'm gonna export this variable call pass okay let's see if we have this variable so we're gonna use echo call pass yes it is here now let's run the command one more time call say hello world Let's press enter. All right, that's great. It works. So this is really good. Actually, it's not a pretty useful software package, but at least it's fun to use. Anyway, I think that's all about this video. I'm gonna see you in the next tutorial. In the last tutorial, we have learned that when you try to install some software packages, you will go to the available repository, find the right package and install it to your system. I will already show you where the repository files are located. So they are located in etc yum.repos.d directory under this directory. As you see that all the files are located here. So let me just open one of them. Let's open CentOS repo. And for that we need to use vim text editor. So basically this is how yum repositories are configured. For example, this is the repo ID, this is the repo name, this is the metalink or base URL that provides the location to the repository where all the software packages are located. And then we have GPG key file, the path of the file, and etc. Actually, you don't need to understand all of them right now because I will show you how to create a local repository step by step. So let's just get started. Okay. So let me clear the screen. So to create a local repository in CentOS 9, you need to install the required packages. I'm gonna install create repo. It is used to create a local repository. I think I made a typo here. So create repo. And then we are gonna install yum utils. It contains utilities that can be used to manage repositories. And let's just provide the Y option and then press enter. Sorry, we need to be a root user. So I'm going to use sudo i. And then let's copy this form, paste it here and run it. It's complete. As a next step, we need to create a directory where we'll store the packages for the local repository. You can create this directory anywhere on your system, but for this tutorial, uh, we are gonna create it in the www.html directory I mean under var directory so I'm gonna use make directory 
and then provide the P option because we're going to have lots of folders. And then under var, we are going to have www, then HTML. And under this directory, let's create a local repo. Press enter. So after that, after creating the directory, we're going to need to copy the packages that we want to include in the local repository to the local repo directory, to this directory. So we can copy the packages from another system or we can just download them from the internet. For example, let's say you want to create a local repository for the Nginx web server. We can download the packages for Nginx. So we're going to use yum download and let's provide the destination directory. So destination directory will be var, sorry, var www html and under that we have a local repo. And then just provide the package name so it is nginx. Since it is installed let's do lsl var www html local repo. All right, Nginx RPM package is here. Once we have copied, we have downloaded the packages to the repository directory. We need to create the repository metadata using the creator repo command. I hope you already remember metadata because we already talked about it in the first tutorial of this section. So I'm going to use that command. We're going to use create repo and under our local repository. So if you run this command, it will create metadata for the repository. Let's press enter. It just created. Let's see what we have there. LSL w sorry var wwhtml. Under that we have local repo, and we have here repo data. It just created the necessary metadata for the repository and stored it in the repo data directory. Let me clear the screen. So the next step is to configure Yum to use the local repository. We're going to configure the Yum package manager to use the local repository. So in order to do this, we're going to create new repository file. So let's use touch under ATC. We have Yum repository directory. And under this directory, I'm going to create a new file. Let's call it local repo, for example that repo file and let's open it so I'm gonna use min text editor to open the file we need to create a file that is similar to CentOS repo let me show you one more time if you remember we have CentOS repo file here so this is how we should configure our VM repository file we're gonna create something similar so let's look at that. So we're going to start from the repo ID. Let's call it for local repo. And then we need to provide our repository name. So it will be local repository. But you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter actually. And then we need to provide metalink or let's call it base URL because in some system you're gonna see this base URL not meta link and base URL in this case will be file but I'm gonna show you one more thing so under this CentOS repo as you see that it is a meta link so this URL starts with HTTPS because this is a remote repository and all the software packages are located in this remote repository that's why it starts with HTTPS but we are going to create a local repository. So therefore, we are going to use file system URL. I'm going to use file, file to dot, then to slash, and then we need to provide the path where the, our local repository is located. Basically, it's under root. We have var directory, then we have www, and then we have HTML, and under that we have local repo. The third component will be enabled equal to one. So this means that the repository is enabled 
or active for use by you. When you set it to 1, you will use the repository to search for and install the packages. If you set it to 0, then the repository is disabled and you will not use it to search for or install the packages. And the last one we are going to use gb gpk k equals to 0 because we don't have any. I'm sorry, it should be gpk check equals to 0. If we set it to 1, we also need to provide the key file. But in our case, it doesn't matter, so I'm just going to set it to 0. And let's save this file. As a last step, we need to verify if the local repository is working or not. So for that, I'm going to use yum repolist. If it's enabled to active, it will be shown here. Okay, as I see that our local repository is here. So that's it. You have successfully created a local repository in CentOS 9. You can now use this repository to install packages on any system in your network. Let's do that in the next video. In the last tutorial, we have created a local repository which stores the Nginx package. Now I will show you how to install that package using Yum Package Manager from our local repository. It's actually very simple. I'm going to disable all the repositories except the local repository so that Yum will install the package from the local repository. So let's just run Yum. And then we are going to use disable repo option. Sorry, it should be disable repo. And then I'm going to use star sign. It's a wildcard, so it will just uh, disable all the repos. And then we are going to enable only local repo. And then basically we install Nginx. Let's press enter. Okay, we just received an error. It says that there's a conflicting request. So basically, what does it mean? It means that these packages are the dependencies and they are now missing. That's why we have to install these dependencies. So right now we have three of them. And after all dependencies are resolved, then we can install Nginx. So I'm going to just download the RPM packages of these dependencies to the current directory. So I'm going to use you. Then let's use dollar. And I'm just going to copy paste one by one. We have Nginx core. And we have Nginx file system. Okay, let's just put a space here. Press enter. Let's do LSL. Yes, we just downloaded all the RPM packages. As a next step, I'm going to install them. So I'm going to use yum install. So it will install these RPM packages. So what, what are the missing packages? Let's use this one. And then we have engine score. And the last one, which is Nginx file system. Let's also put Y option. So it will not ask for confirmation. Press enter. Once we have installed the missing dependencies, then you can try to install Nginx again. So we're going to use, actually we have used that command. Okay, this one. Let's press enter. Okay, seems the Nginx is found in the local repository. So, and all the dependencies are resolved. That's why it will just install this Nginx package. So let's put Y and then enter. Great, since all the dependencies are resolved, you just installed Nginx successfully. After installing Nginx, you can verify that it's running correctly by checking its status. So I'm going to clear the screen and we're going to use system CTL status Nginx. 
Yes, I think it's uh, installed successfully, but right now it is not active. So that's why it says inactive. I'm gonna just start the service. So I'm gonna use start. And then let's check the status again. Yes, it's active and running. So that's it. You have successfully installed Nginx from the local repository. You can use the same process to install other packages from the local repository. I hope this tutorial was helpful and I'm gonna see you in the next tutorial. Process management is very important skill in Linux as every action on Linux server involves starting a process. To be running processes on your CentOS 9 system, you can use the PC command. Just type PC and press enter. This command provides a list of running processes on your system. By default, PS only shows the processes running in your current shell session. But to see all the running processes, we can use PS with this A option or also this E option. It doesn't matter. Actually, let's use A option and then press enter. So this command actually is very common Linux command used to list all running processes on the system, including those owned by other users. The output of this command includes several columns with information about each process. For example, the first one is PID, which is a process ID. The second one is the, it shows actually the terminal associated with the process. If there is no terminal associated with the process, then this field will be set to question mark. Let's see if we have other things. Yeah, we have, for example, this one is TTY1. And then we have third column, which is time. It is actually displays the amount of CPU time used by the process. The last one is command. So it just displays the name of the command or process that is running. Instead of this command, I mean PS with option A, I often use PS. Let me clear the screen. So I often use PS with options A, U, X. This displays a comprehensive list of all running processes in Linux, regardless of which user owns them. For example, in this output, I'm going to show you. So in this output, we have several columns. The first one is user. It just shows the username of the user who started the process. And we have also some processes that started by us or Nginx web server or Nginx user, sorry. And then second column, which is PID, it just shows the again process ID. Third and the fourth column, which is CPU and memory. These columns show the percentage of the CPU and memory used by the process. The fifth and the sixth columns show their virtual and resident memory size. And we have again this uh, terminal column, which just shows the terminal associated with the process. And if there is no terminal, of course, it will be set to a question mark. And then we have the status, which can include values such as running, sleeping and others. These two columns, start and time, they will show the start time and the CPU time used by the process respectively. And finally, we have the last column which displays the name of the command or process that is running. Let's look at the process which was started by Nginx. So I'm going to show you. Here we have three process, Nginx process. One of them, which is a master process. It started by a root user. And then we have other two process. They are worker processes and they are started by the Nginx user. Since we see these processes, it means that Nginx service is running in our system. So let's check the status of this service. I'm going to use systemctl status Nginx. Okay, the service is active and running. So that's why we see the Nginx processes. Now I'm going to stop this service. Sorry, I'm just going to use this sudo access so sudo system ctl stop nginx so it is stopped let's check the status okay it's not active anymore i'm gonna run this ps command one more time and then i will grab the nginx 
as you see that we don't have engineers process anymore if we delete this part so somewhere here we have engineers processes but right now we don't have this process because we just stopped the service and if I run it again I mean if I start the process uh, I'm gonna use sudo systemctl then start let's check the status okay it is active and it's running so let's run this command one more time again we have these three processes master process and two worker process so just keep in mind that in general we have three types of processes the first one is kernel threads which are the essential part of the linux kernel then we have processes that provide services are known as demons and they are generally started during the computer boot up the last process type is a shell job which is started from the command line let's learn how shell jobs are managed in the next tutorial commands initiated from the command line are known as shell jobs also called interactive processes and are linked with the shell in use when the process started when a user types a command then a shell job is initiated in the absence of specific actions the job starts as a foreground process and takes up the terminal it was launched from until it is completion for example let's look at the sleep command if i type sleep 15 then it will take up the terminal for 15 seconds and during that period i cannot do anything because it's a foreground process either i need to wait for it to complete or i need to stop the process and as you notice that it just stopped sometimes you will need to run a command that takes a long time for example imagine that you want to copy a file whose size is hundreds of gigabytes to a remote server in this case if your internet connection is not good then it will take a very long time to copy the file and the process will just take up the terminal therefore if the command that you want to run doesn't require any user interaction and you know that it will take a long time to complete then it might be useful to run it in the background for that we are going to use ampersand let's say you want to run sleep command in the background so i'm going to use sleep and let's say 100 second and if i want to run it in the background i'm going to use this ampersand and press enter this job is now started in the background if you want to set it as foreground job then you can just write fg fg which means foreground which will set the last background job as a foreground job let's press enter as you see that now it brings this job to the foreground i'm not gonna wait for it to complete i'm just gonna use ctrl c to stop the process think about that what if there are multiple jobs running in the background and you just want to bring one of them to the foreground for this you can use the job id let's say we're gonna start three jobs in the background so i'm gonna use sleep 100 and then ampersand and the second one let's say will be 150 and the third one will be 200 at first we're gonna use jobs command to see how many jobs we have in the background so let's type jobs and press enter as you see that in the background we have three jobs i would like to bring the second job to the foreground so for that i'm gonna use fg command which is foreground and then i'm gonna use the job id of the second command i mean the second job so the job id is 2 i'm gonna use fg2 and if i press enter it will bring that job to the foreground let me stop it for now and let me clear the screen we also have some useful key combinations related to jobs in certain cases a job may have been initiated and could take a longer duration than expected in such situations you can use ctrl c which we just did and it will terminate the current job and removes it from the memory for example let's say we're gonna run sleep 3000 and press enter so this command takes longer time we can use ctrl c to stop the process however since it will stop the job and remove it from the memory it means we will not able to continue with this job later 
Therefore, it is better to stop the job temporarily using the Ctrl Z command. So I'm gonna use Ctrl Z and it just stopped this job and other two jobs uh, they were in the background actually. So if it is written down, then it means that these jobs are done. But the Ctrl Z command just stopped this job. What does it mean? It means that the job is not erased or removed from the memory. It is just put on hold to be managed later. When the job is suspended, it can be resumed as background job using the BG command. For example, let's run BG. And then we can also bring it to the foreground. I'm going to use FG. And now it's in the foreground. I think that's all about shell jobs. I'm going to see you in the next tutorial. Top and HTOP are the two popular system monitoring tools. These tools help you to monitor the system resources such as CPU usage, memory usage and disk usage. While top utility is a simple text-based tool, HTOP is a more advanced interactive tool. Let's start from the top utility. Just type top and press enter. The top command is used to display information about the system's processes. This command will display a real-time list of the processes running on the system along with resource usage statistics for each process. Let me explain this output. The first line displays the current time and how long the system has been running. This is the time that we have and it says this CentOS machine is up to 7 days. It also shows the number of users currently logged in. So right now there is only one user. And the last three values, I mean these three values, display how much the system is loaded or in other words it shows the system load average over the past 1, 5 and 15 minutes. In our case all values are 0 which indicates very low CPU utilization. The second line provides an overview of the current state of the system's processes. There are a total of 98 processes, one of them is currently running and we have 97 already it is 99 sleeping process then we have zero stopped and zero zombie process by the way zombie process refers to a process that has been terminated but not properly cleaned up and then we have the third line the cpu line so this line shows cp utilization broken down by the individual cpu cores right now it seems we have only one core but if you press number one, it will show all the CPU cores. So let's type one. And now as you see that we have two CPU cores. By the way, you can also use lscpu command to check all the info about the CPU. Let me just show you quickly. Just press Q to exit to quit this command. So I'm gonna write lscpu. This command displays information about the CPU architecture. So if you look at here, okay, it's here. If you look at here, you will see that we have two CPUs. Anyway, let's go back to the our top command. So just write top. And the values that shown here are the percentage of the time that CPU spends in different states, such as user space, idle state, and etc. And last two lines shows the memory usage about the system. For example, it says we have around two gigabytes of RAM or memory, and of which one gigabyte is almost free, and we have uh, this amount available memory, and we don't have any swap space. All other information, all this information, are kind of the same as the information we have seen in the output of PS command. I would like to show you a few practical examples that can be useful when using top tool. Let's say that you want to sort the processes by memory usage in descending order. So for that you can just press shift M. You will see the processes with the highest memory usage at the top of the list. For example this process just uses 1.8% of the memory. Or let's say you want to sort the processes by the CPU usage. So for this we can press shift P and it will just sort the processes by the CPU usage. 
Let's also use htop command. So I'm just gonna quit this tool. Let's clear the screen and just type htop, press enter. Oops, it says that this command is not found. So it says we don't have this utility. It is because it's not the default tool in CentOS. You will need to install this tool. So I'm gonna use sudo view install htop and then let's put y option and press enter and let's clear the screen let's now write htop press enter all right it works so as you see that htop provides a more user-friendly interface and some additional features to top for example you don't need to press shift m to sort the processes by memory usage you just sort the list by simply clicking on the column header for example right now it sorts the list by cpu usage if you press here if you click here it will sort it by the memory usage or you can sort by the pid or command htop utility allows you to customize the interface to suit your preferences including changing the colors sorting order and process filtering before ending this tutorial, let me tell you why it is called htop. So here, letter H stands for Hisham, which is the first name of the developer, Hisham Muhammad, who created this tool. Alright then, I think that's all about top and htop utilities. Bye bye.